What's up, Fire Tribe? Welcome to Rising from the Ashes. I'm Dan Unaki Dan. And I'm the homie Romy. What is going on, sir? What's good, man? Today, we are here with Michael Juan. Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike. <laughs> Synchro Mystic. The Susquehanna River Mystery Mystic. What's going on, Michael Juan? <sighs> Dan and Roman, <laughs> what... You know, I do a lot of shows. I like to do shows. Like that's, you know, that, uh, and and I pay attention. I pay a lot of attention to the people who I'm I'm talking to, and I and I pay attention to all these different ways. And your two voices, your two voices as like radio, like like just audio quality. Like if there wasn't even any video, are so like old school gold, like 1980s, <laughs> like like 3 a.m. like radio. Yeah, yeah, like, like, I got that. That sort of I like that, that quality. Three, yeah. Yeah, and you're like yeah tell me more like you guys got something <laughs> going on real good i'm real happy to be here oh man wow Thanks, man. juiced up dude juiced up well uh yeah, appreciate it, that it's it's an honor to be with he, you here today because you're doing a lot of great work and it's it's broad right like you started in in and from my understanding of observing your work you started with this this work that like underlies this, this theme that we're going on this month is like syncretism, the stacking of cultures. And you started breaking down this thing that nobody had a fucking clue about on a wide scale level. And you brought it to the internet. It's called the Susquehanna river mystery, right? Or alchemy, Susquehanna river alchemy. And it has woken the people up because people are decoding cities now people are looking at this crazy syncretic matchup and you labeled a term also that people are using all over the fucking internet now synchro mysticism if i'm not mistaken did you coin i definitely that did not label synchro mysticism Damn I'm not, I, I'll, I'll take credit for the for the susquehanna i'll take credit there but i'm not going to take credit for synchro mysticism and i'm going to give it i believe the gentleman uh jake coatsy Jake Coatsy oh. is the first person I ever heard. Uh, his stuff blew my mind in 2007. And so it's like, I like fanboy him sometimes on Instagram. I don't think, so. I don't think he does <laughs> anything like that. I'm like, da, 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 da. And he just like kind of gives me like, like, who are you, dude? Like, he's like, I don't think that's his world anymore. But, but I think he's the first person to use that term. Wow. Yeah, it's, I like it because you got synchronistic. Meh. Synchro mystic what's the like, difference yeah, exactly to you to me well when, when we're talking about synchro mysticism it it broadens it broadens the the scope of what you can look at like everything is in play and whether you're talking about like a lyric from a song, an experience in your life, an episode from a TV show, uh, a shape in the clouds, like they all hold weight because from the mystical perspective, like everything is part, you, you come with the, with, the, with the understanding that, that everything is connected on a certain level. If you're going to go deep enough, it's all connected. So from that level, like everything's in play. Uh, that to me is the magic of synchro mysticism. And what that does is it takes the governor off of the, the, the limitations of what we think is, is related or relatable um, and how we were raised in culture. Like, I mean, they say this all the time, like, well, you know, the human brain is actually designed to see patterns. And I'm like, well, exactly. The human brain is designed to see patterns. Don't you think you should be looking at them? And so, 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 but, but there's a dance and, and maybe we could talk about this in a moment. I caught the, uh, the, 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 the James Shelby Downer vortex Ooh. of like, how you play with patterns because it is like if we're gonna if if you're going to go into the world of synchromysticism if you're going to go a little bit more than dipping your toe into it because very soon your life gets involved with it you have to be able to be like all right well you know i'm gonna to have to i'm it comes with a bit of like danger in the fact mm -hmm. that you can get lost in it but the it is the act of getting lost in it 
and then coming out of it where to me is where the real beauty of and the of the teaching of the experience of synchro mysticism is which is like the mystery of life and how does it relate and how are you controlled and how are you controlling and when it it is an entry point for so many people of the idea of synchro mysticism because you're like okay now i have permission slip a permission slip to begin to play I have a permission slip to begin to think of things in a way which before I was not told, I was told I wasn't allowed to see. Mm -hmm. to look at that way. It's cracking open that cosmic egg, that proverbial pot of understanding. Uh, and it's wild. Uh, let, let me ask you this, if you don't mind, um, since this is the form of the conversation is an interview. <laughs> let me ask, let me ask you this. Um, what was one of the first moments in your in your uh, in your research in your life? Um, because at this point, you know, deep down the synchro mystic rabbit hole, life is research and everything is in taking this type of information to kind of guide us on the path. And hopefully synchro mysticism has aligned people with their intuition. Because one of the things with synchronicities is it's you're aligning and opening yourself to intuition. So what was one of those moments, especially with the Susquehanna River mystery, that you really like opened your eyes and was like, this is fucking it. What the I, fuck type I, of I, mystery I, am I living in? So, so, so. All right, brother. Here we go. It's such a nice, like, <laughs> like, like, I like the way that you set that up because I like to tell the story um, because there was, there was a moment where that happened. And I have always been um, like, you know, I, I was, I was always, a, I was always a little bit out there, let's say, but I, but I was able to walk the main line, the mainstream. So like I was, I was acceptable out there, like uh, growing up, like in, in just like normal, like in school and, and like having friends and popularity. And like, I was always like, that was my life, but I was always the weirdo in that group. So I, 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 I lived that. And it wasn't until the, what happened with the, revelation of the Susquehanna mystery that that like I'm like okay this is this is this is more than everything else was just preparation for this so okay so the, I want to say the Susquehanna mystery I, I time is so hard for me right now to like say like how many years things have been but let's say this is like 2015 and um I had just uh I had just split up from my wife uh, who I'd been married to, or at least in a relationship for about 15 years, maybe 20 years, all said and done. Uh, wow. We had two children. Um, like it was, it was a really big friggin' deal for me. Um, like I knew that we were breaking up, but, but I did not realize how much of my life was also going to change. I mean, that's just like one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the, the effects of what our culture has done in the fact, like, you know, these things happen. So like, there's nothing unique to me for anyone who's been through divorce, who knows what I'm talking about, particularly, you know, how it affects men. So I'm in that space, you know, and then, and when, whenever you go through something that rocks you, you know, you are, you're, you're, you're different, you're different, you know, regardless of what the rocking may be. So, so I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I'm rocked. And then what, what happens though also is, my my wife at the time she was also what kept me grounded in like regular reality yeah and so a lot of times like a lot of my fr my friends at the time um i think like i i kind of got like a i got I got normal street cred from my wife. So like, well, she's married to him. He can't be that nuts. And then as soon as we like split up, like, yeah, 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 you're that nuts. But what that did for me was it allowed me to have like no governor, like no sort of control on what, what I would say, what I would research, because well, a big part of the, and this is, you know, this was eight years ago or what have you, like a big part of what was a, that began as a rift 
between me and, and my then wife was the fact that I started looking into some things she didn't want anyone to be looking into. Like, like people weren't comfortable, like talking all about like MK Ultra and 9-11 in 2004. Like, that, like people weren't ready for that then. And I was like, oh, that's all I want to talk about. So, so I was able to really get into like whatever was capturing my attention. And at the time I was fascinated with conspiracy. I was fascinated with psychology. I was fascinated with magic. I was fascinated with like neuro-linguistic programming, like everything from like as, as abstract and theoretical to as concrete, like how is this actually used? Um, so I, I'm in this rocked place with all this information and uh, like this background of, 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 of stuff of which I've been following and, and researching for some time. Like it was like my full-time job doing research at a time, which probably was also part of the reason I got divorced. But um, uh, I go and I move into this town in Pennsylvania. And it was my ex-wife who found me this apartment because I'd moved somewhere else. And she was, she was, she was the, the admissions director at the, at the school which our children went to. And she was like, there's a place, it's just opened up this apartment right across the street from the school. It would be so good if you could be here because I was immensely active and involved in my children's life. I still am, but, but that was a big deal. And when I'd moved away, uh, you know, I was only like an hour away, but still like, I mean, all of the, all of the normal things that affect families and humans and children when, when, when family structures begin to break up. So she finds me this place and I'm like, I said to myself years earlier, I would never live in that town. I don't know why I said that, but I had that yeah. memory. But I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, I'm, I, I guess I got nowhere else to be because I wasn't really too satisfied with where I was at the time. Got a little airplane overhead. Um, and so I find myself, I, I, I'm like, okay, I'll take a look at it. But I already like, you know, I, I got a little bit of a, of a, of a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, I don't want to go to this place. And like, I go and I look at the building and I'm real particular about my environment. I'm it, like, it has to, it has to Long hit shui. like a lot of things. Like, and part of it is like, it's, it can't be like visually uh, offensive to me. I can't be in something like that. I'm looking on the outside of this building. I'm like, I don't know. And then I walk in, it was like a walk up in this like old town It's a building that it was built in like the late 1800s. And I walk, you go into this like lobby and it's like cramped and horrible carpeting. And it was like, maybe like <laughs> seven foot ceilings. And I'm like, nah, there's no way I'm moving into this crack den. And I, but I'm, I'm with the guy and I walk <laughs> up and we go to the door and he opens the door to this apartment. And he opens the door, swings open, and then it's these 14-foot ceilings. And it's like these eight-foot windows all around. And it was, wow. and I was like, wow, I could be here. I could be here. And so I, 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 I slowly am, am pulled into this place, like in, in Marietta, Pennsylvania. So within two weeks, within two weeks of moving in there, like it was, I want to say it was like, it was March. It was, it was either April or April one or March one was when I moved in. And within two weeks, like, like I lived in the general area before, which is right. And this is a river town right on the Susquehanna river. And I was like, well, what is this river? What is this thing? And I just go to Wikipedia and I start like just reading about it on Wikipedia, which very quickly like led me to this historical document called the John Smith map of Virginia. And within like two minutes of looking at this thing, like I see that there's a reversed 40 on it for the 40th parallel. This is like one of the most significant, like historically significant maps in terms of the story we're told about the colonization of the of North mm -hmm. America. And I, I'm looking at it. There's this big picture of the Susquehanna a Susquehannock one, which is why Wikipedia linked to it. And I'm, I'm like, this is a code. I've got enough of a background in understanding like uh, 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 secret societies and Rosicrucians and like all this sort of stuff that when I saw a reverse 40, I was like, there's something going on. And I'm like, this seemingly is pointing at the Susquehanna River and the 40th parallel. And I'm like, I wonder where that is. And I <laughs> type it in and I'm literally like the, the like there are from like 40 degrees to 41 degrees 
is 70 miles, like from mm -hmm. north to south. That's basically what it is. So I am literally living at four zero dot zero 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 Holy zero shit. one degrees. And I'm like, what sort of game am I playing? And then it kept getting richer and richer and richer. But from the very beginning, I'm finding myself right in the middle. And to be quite honest, and to be quite honest, I'm like, I don't think there's another cat on the planet who is going to be able to make these sort of connections. Like they, the, like the, 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 the type of information which I am interested in, like, is very, very specific. And not many people have like mm -hmm. that same, or at least at that time, have that same level of interest in all of these different things. So like, to be able to like, look at that map and put all this stuff together and then find yourself living in it. I'm just like, I'm not really certain what's going on. <laughs> I'm not Your certain. Wife put you, she, she almost put you, she, she was like, okay, fucking god damn it mike like you're you're, you're focusing on all this crazy stuff you you want to research you you know so on and so forth but i you know i still love you i'm gonna take care of you i'm gonna put you in this spot but little did she know that she put you in the spot that was gonna set you off onto the path the synchromistic path in which has led you down the river of understanding uh, what i i mean uh i i think about that a lot um I have a I have a phenomenal I have a phenomenal relationship with with my ex wife, um, like I I have like <laughs> I've got quite a few people who I could put ex like girlfriends or ladies lady friends which I could put ex in front of that title and unfortunately like a, a bunch of them <laughs> you know I would still like to have like a nice rapport with them but I don't have nice rapports with them <laughs> but this one the 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 one who I was who who I was married to who probably more than anyone else has reason to like to like maybe harbor something towards me um not that I think I deserve that but like I can understand that but she does not and there is something like you know however you want to go and and define the nature of reality and define the nature of relationships whether you want to say like past lives or soul agreements or maybe it's all random maybe it's all whatever whatever that is me and her have like there is something there which uh in that relationship which feeds each other in this amazingly supportive way um earlier today it's funny i told you the story of i moved there because she was the admissions director at the school which our children went to and our youngest son just graduated from that school today it was eighth grade graduation Aww. and so she left the day after she was like the moment that was done like she was like i'm ready to be done working at this job i was only there because i wanted to be close that close in my in my boys lives and so like there's this it's interesting that that we are kicking off this conversation like with the timing like this has been really really like front and center in my mind uh just like because of what's been happening in my life recently like just re taking restock of all my relationships and like how and where i am now how i got here where i'm going both you know looking at myself as an individual and myself as part of like a collective and so yeah it's it's funny that you bring this up and and there there seemingly is or at least i can only say within my own self but i don't think i'm unique this way but there are these certain relationships which we have in life which continue to feed us and serve us in ways which we can't you know you you could never anticipate and it's it's very poetic and ironic Dan, yeah, I mean, I'm in the same spot in life right now, so I'm I'm looking for my Sasquahana. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. It's 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 an interesting. Um, so, kind of on the on this tip of like, you know, people in our lives that that fuel us and like give us a very specific type of vibratory response. Um, you know, I, I've been looking into this, you know, when I say looking into it, I've been looking into the book that is my mind, my, you know, intuition and whatever these pages of thought have to tell me. And it's like, okay, am I an old soul? Are we all old souls? Is reincarnation the thing? And if so, are we choosing the life and the vessel that we, that we go into? And we have this specific type of mission that maybe we didn't get to um, fulfill in our, in our last chance. And so, you know, um, secret, secret, everybody, 
Dan and I are working on a on a secret little uh, uh, comic, and uh, maybe in this comic we might have a, a special realm that when you die, you go to another realm, and in that realm you're learning all this etherical knowledge, but you don't remember it when you go back down to the physical realm because even though it's massive amounts of information that you're learning and your soul is learning and you know it. You don't remember it when you're back down here. And so these paths that we put ourselves on and we don't fucking know it. It's like, why do we meet the people we meet and go the places we go, especially once we tear open that page of synchro mysticism and our intuition is just completely warmed up in a line and we start doing all the things that is supposed to be right and you're remembering things again and it's coming to you and it makes sense and you don't even want to question it because it just feels so fucking good that it's happening. It's crazy. It blows my mind. <laughs> what do you think, Dan? You haven't said anything for a moment. I want to hear your voice. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, synchronicity is, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how it works, man. Uh, I kind of, I'm kind of a go with the flow kind of person. So I kind of, uh, I understand. I think about every situation a thousand fucking times and then like, and then something else will come along that just like, Oh, how come I didn't just go with that before? And then I, and then I flow down that side of the river and ends up taking me on a journey. Sometimes I wonder though, if I, sometimes I take wrong turns and I get distracted and then, you know, eventually return back to the same spot I was supposed to be at later. But, um, you know what I mean? Like some things, sometimes you get like uh, some type of blockage or it's an uh, eddy. Yeah, a, a detour around the long way instead of the short way that you probably could have took. But yeah, man, I've been on. I think this whole journey for me with podcasting and meeting Roman and uh, all the people that we've met through this has been completely synchronistic, and I've I've been enjoying it and uh, just kind of riding riding that wave man and uh um i'm thankful for it so I, i'm happy with i, I kind of just fall in line with life and let it guide me into the directions that it wants to go instead of trying right, to fight right. it um go with it and uh find the solutions to those other problems when they when they when they get there so I want to I want to kind of play with both of the things which 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 you guys both said. So I want to go back to 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 Roman um, when you're talking about like you know you're walking us through uh, like a couple different models of possibility of like you know what the hell is going on like you know whether it's reincarnation or <laughs> or mean? or you know like you know we we have this information then we come here and we forget it and um, and then and then. Dan, you were saying what, what really jumped out at me was about, um, you know, making wrong turns or wrong decisions or finding myself coming back to the same sort of place um, where I'm meeting it right now. And, and all we're doing is we're just discussing because we're trying to understand, like, what the hell is this? Right. Like, you know, it's not like, you know, what we have are our understandings and our opinions or what and what have you based upon a variety of things. So um, where I'm sitting right now and, and, and things have gotten real in the, in the past, since, since the beginning of this year, like my life has changed immensely. Um, uh, like I'm just, I'm doing away with all the stories and it's like, I don't know if, like, if I don't know if it's not observable and knowable, like I'm not so interested in it. That doesn't mean that I'm not saying it's not factual. I'm just saying like, I'm not gonna put energy there as much as I'm gonna put energy for what I can see and know and experience and see where where I'm going uh, or, or, or what's opening up. When I say where I'm going, like where, to your point, Dan, like where's life taking me? Because yeah. it's get, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up right now, and I think this is a really interesting question is because from, from my perspective, like things are where life is going to unfold for our experience here on earth, you know, like, you know, the, in a very practical way and how we live with all of the, the stuff, which is seemingly coming down the pike, you're either going to go with what is being like strung out in front of you or breadcrumbed for you, or you're going to have to really, really like jump off 
And if you're going to jump off, you're going to have to go with, um, uh, it, you're going to have to be in a true flow state because you're not going to have models or stories to go by because I mean, this is my opinion, at least every story and model, which I have in my mind, I know came from the matrix. And I know that I know that they're slippery. I know that they're really, <laughs> really slippery. And so because of that, like the easier thing for me to do is say, I got to write it all off. Or if I'm going to have a story, I'm going to write my own. But I at least understand that I'm, I'm, I'm believing my own BS. Yeah, well, we have like, that's what I'm understanding now is like, we have that ability, that malleability to write our own story. And though, you know, there's, there's like all of these like categorized places you can go and, you know, you, you, you really, once, once you start opening up to the flow, like you're like, wow, like, okay, what direction do I want to go? And it, it, you know, I know, and, but the other thing is too, that's really interesting about this is like humans have this tendency to go towards the toxic things. And I'm not sure what it is about that sort of like societal engineering or like the strange magnetism towards toxicity, but it just is so much more enduring to people to toxicify them, them their souls and bad, their bodies. Bad things are attractive. I mean, Things I mean, they that, always, no, you're not that, supposed that, to do are uh, more attractive. Why? I mean, th that was yeah. the, 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 the Freudian, uh, what are they, what is it? The death wish or like, you know, that, that, that is one of the, the, the strongest drives within humanity is the drive towards death and the desire to <laughs> die. I mean, that was the whole like, they yeah, like all the death the cult industry. They're like, we're going to make our the warning the the biggest warning possible because we know that actually like increases sales. It's not like a a, mm -hmm. a punishment to to do so. Um, but but to your point, Roman, like like that's what I'm really interested in right now. Is I I'm just kind of like a generally frame it in the fr the terminology of the mechanics of consciousness, like specifically yes. the relationship between the inner world and the outer world. Like, you know, what's going on in your head, how you define something, what you're looking at, like what it means to you, and then what you're looking at outside. And then somehow they, 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 they link up. And then that really like on a certain level, on a, on a, a, on a practical level, that becomes your reality. But then on this like mystery of life, like I don't understand where we are, how we got here, what we're supposed to do sort of mystery of life. Like somehow it starts creating things. And sometimes the things it creates, like maybe is like what Dan was saying is just like, you know, these, these eddies that keep bringing you around, or maybe they're like, this is how you're beginning to understand like what the, the nature of this realm is. And I want to give you like a specific story of what I'm talking about, why I'm saying this is, is the, when I began with the Susquehanna mystery, when I began mm -hmm. telling that and like, and, 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 and bringing out all of the, the data points on it, there was, there's a, a pretty big Masonic element to it. And though when I tell the story, I personally, as a storyteller, try to walk the the middle path and like neither like uh, uh, put up on a pedestal nor condemn like any of the the groups of people allowing each person to do that themselves um, like it was still kind of like a negative a negative uh, sort of connotation and so a couple of uh, a couple of <laughs> months ago I got invited by this Masonic organization, to uh, present all of this information. And it was funny and ironic because that's where it all began. And when it all began, no one was really interested in it. They thought I was nuts. And like the very <laughs> group, the very group, which I was talking about, like, you know, it, 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 it reaches the peak where they go and they're, they're like, hey, will you come in and teach us what you go in about us? You know, that whole sort of thing. And then I saw- Can you tell me about me? <laughs> I saw all of this crazy stuff in the invitation to it and, and it fit in so perfectly hand in glove with some of my other research, particularly a presentation I did uh, another one on the higher side chats on the Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. um, uh, ritual. And then I'm like, 
is this really happening? And I was, I was forced, I was forced to ask myself, I'm like, do I really believe if I wanted to, I could have very easily have come to the conclusion that I'm going to be ritualistically sacrificed. Like mm-hmm. all of the, all the signs were there. And I had to ask myself, I'm like, you know, do I really believe this? Do I really believe that I'm walking into a situation where they're going to sacrifice me because the signs are here. And for whatever reason, like that, that reality became a reality. Like this is the stuff I talk about. And now this is in my life. And now I got to say, am I really going to get sacrificed? Am I really going to get sacrificed? Um, And at the end of the day, I eventually came to the conclusion. I'm like, I don't really think it's going to happen, but if it does, I want to go out on my feet. You know what? I'm going to face, I'm going to face it on my feet. Um, I went to the thing. I made like a, a, I gave the normal presentation and then I made this kind of big deal about like, uh, I flipped the script on them and I'm like, Hey, did you know about this? And like, are you trying to kill me? And I was being silly. I didn't really think they were trying to kill me, but I wanted to flip it on them. And then like my, my conclusion was this, I'm like, I think I'm being initiated. I don't know who's writing this script, but they're initiating me into something because you as, or as members of the Freemasons are the, the, the symbol of initiation in the culture and you got to witness this. And so like I bowed in this whole sort of thing. Um, and then the next day, my life turned upside down. And so the, the reason next day, I'm telling the story, I'm sorry. The next day, like absolute, like the following day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to get, it's, it's kind of personal. It's kind of dirty laundry ish, but like, yeah, it happened the next day. It happened Ooh. the very next day. Okay. And so I was forced and I'm still forcing. And this is one of the reasons why I'm saying like, I'm really like becoming much more, much more conscious. I've always been aware of the power of story and the power of story within like one's consciousness and then how it creates one's reality. But I saw it so clearly and closely. And I saw how that story, like it could have made me nuts about like thinking that I was going to be ritualistically sacrificed if I wanted to really like double down and accept that to be the truth, which I wanted to follow, but I didn't, but nonetheless, it still flipped my life upside down. And, and I'm finding myself in a place, which I don't think I would have gotten to had I not done this whole sort of Masonic sort of thing, but it's, and I'm in this flow state and now I'm finding like almost the same way you, you, Dan, and I think you said you were talking about a little bit before, uh, before we started recording Roman about the synchronicities, which you have been finding through this realm of podcasting. Since I found myself in this new state of flow in a way which I've never in my 50 years have ever lived quite like this before, I'm finding these like these, these continual like confirmations, like this is the way it's going. And you're either going to have to jump in and like allow this current of whatever, whatever is like moving the realm, what is never creating the greater experience of life. Like you're either going to have to, you know, have the balls to jump right in and not have any idea what you're jumping into. And you have to give up your foregone conclusions of what you think the future is going to look like. Or, I mean, you might as well just put, you just might as well like uh, surgically attach your VR glasses and climb yourself yeah. in, in, the, in the matrix bathtub because maybe it's in six months, maybe it's in six years, but all roads lead there. If you're not saying like, if you don't recognize that like everything in culture is making you more and more connected to the system, well, and that system is going to become more and more inv- invasive, like, like that, that's where it's going to go. There's no other way. It's not going to stop. It won't stop. So you, you either have to jump off it or you're going to, you're going to go, you're going to end up there. Mm-hmm. Oof. Mm-hmm. So do you go with the flow or do you jump off the ship? Well, I mean, I, I had no choice. I jumped off. And, and the reason, so, so I, and, and I, I appreciate the opportunity for me to be, um, to kind of like voice this out there because um, I recognize 
You know, anyone who does this sort of thing, like where, where they put their lives out, you know, they, they introduced this to us with like all of the, 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 the Truman shows and the reality TV shows. Mm -hmm. Like there is a, there was a, a conditioning of the mind to prepare the people to be like, yeah, it's cool to share your story. Like, just tell everyone your story. Like, and like, you know, that all the kids want to be, want to be the, the want to be like internet stars. So like, we've been conditioned to do this. I've been conditioned, you've been conditioned. Mm -hmm. And so like you, there, there are a couple ways you can look at it, but I'm going to hold it just here. Like it's a truth. And this is where I am right now. And there are people who've been following some of my stories for, for a period of time. And so I'm continuing showing what's going on right now and specifically what i'm showing is exactly that dan of like this is what it looks like when or one example of what it looks like because i believe it's going to look different for every single person but when you jump off like you're going to get caught it's not going to be the way you like it. You're probably going to have to get used to being uncomfortable. And you're going to realize like, you know, the, the biggest thing that that was the whole Mason thing for me, like, like there was an opportunity that I could have mind fucked myself and be like, oh, this is scary. Like get into fear. Like literally like I could go and like, look at all the scary things that this means and, and like not go through that experience. And if you're jumping off, like that's the hardest part is whatever the story is in each person's mind, each person, if you're watching the show or listening to the show, like, you know, you already are thinking about something about culture. You wouldn't be doing that. And you've probably played out scenarios in your mind of like, you know, I'd do this if I had a bug out or what have you. And there are probably undoubtedly like some fears in there. Like I'm, your fear might be like, you know, I don't know, like starving to death or like, you know, mobs or maybe it's the, the feds or whatever. Like they're, they've got a scarecrow for every single possible fear anyone could have. And that is what what is part of this. What I've experienced and seeing of jumping off the ship is it begins with like, you got to face that fear. And then the thing that really is going to be upsetting is probably what you never expected anyway, but you're going to get like support in ways you're, you're not, you never anticipated. And the reason I'm telling this story is because there's going to have to be a critical mass because there are a whole bunch of people who are enjoying watching this from the comfort of their house and still like ordering the Amazon and still like, you know, <laughs> counting on, on whatever, like the, the, the system is still serving them. And, and the system is still serving me to a, an extent as well. Like, you know, I'm still in it to some degree, but as we begin to see what it looks like, you know, collectively. And so, and then when someone sees like, well, you know what, he did it and it makes it easier for me to go and try something. And chances are uh, what's going to move you is life itself. Your life circumstances are going to move you. And as this becomes more normal, as more and more of these stories happen and people are, are doing this and maybe withdrawing from, from uh, uh, the ways which things were, were done before, well, then that's when critical mass really starts happening. Like, to me, like this, we are in the midst of what it looks like when a large scale transition in how people's lives um, are being, could, uh, could change. And if it doesn't change, if it doesn't change, because what's happening right now is they're just moving from one corral to another. We are in that, sh in that transition right now, which gives the greatest opportunity to step off. That seems like there is a, ver a very big transition going. A lot of people that I talk to seem to be even either like moving locations, uh, breaking up uh, with people that they've been with for a long time, uh, moving on to completely different uh, journeys and adventures than what they're normally used to. It seems like there, it seems like there's a I'm lot seeing. more of that even going on in society. There was a lot of that going on in society and it seems like, lately within the last few months there's been another big jumping off of a lot of different things happening again and and people really going uh that their their personal journeys i guess and going on those what i've noticed and what i think and and this this makes so much sense because there, there, there's a poetic nature to our experience with, and the poetic nature is like, it's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of everything you want is like what you need, like that whole sort of thing, like that's <laughs> built into it. And so what I've been seeing is like, 
like this shift in, in, in people, myself included, is like you spent your entire life this way. And now now when it matters, you're doing the complete opposite. Like, you know, you've you've never settled down and now you're settling down or it's like you've 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 always been settled down and now you're like all over the place. And it's like whatever it is, like the opposite is 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 seemingly like the passageway, the passageway into like for those who are going to step off, because there's a lot of people who aren't. There are a lot of people who aren't. You know, the uh, a good friend of mine, Scotty, like the phrase which he he says over and over again, it's like, you know, we're in bloom or die time. You're either going to bloom mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you're going to die. Like there's no in between. You're either going to be this amazing, ver- like your life is going to be so rich. And when I say amazing version of your life, it is not the definition of what what a Mountain Dew commercial or a, or an Instagram account has showed you what like what an amazing life would mean. I'm talking rich challenging like you know finding out what you're made of laughing like you've never laughed like you know be like everything like heightened like that's the sort of richness of a of a bloomer die it's total so um it's you know i wouldn't say it's unfortunate that ross isn't here um but there was some things that he was going to uh that was going to ask him because he did like you know he does his yearly predictions right and so we're talking about this transitional state that we're in and before uh you know eh, i'm not i don't really consider myself a mystic i love mystical things and i'm not a person who studies super cosmological stuff or astrological stuff um because there's so many people that are good at it and i have so many friends that are uh that are that are doing that that i usually go to them and say hey let's let's chat about this stuff but i will say this i have been saying this since the beginning of 2022 because everybody knows that time has sped up these past few years everybody's time has sped up time has sped up whether it's a placebo speeding up because like is time an actual physical thing is it a sludgy viscous ooze that we do travel through um is it a concept uh you know only or is it a real thing like what the fuck is time but everybody has experienced the same thing all together unanimously for the first time ever right because before this we were all experiencing our lives individually and then sometimes coming together but um inevitably so we all experience the same thing at the same time and it we all experience time kind of like slipping on us and when 2022 came around uh I I just kept saying this is the year of transition. This is the year of transition. I don't know what it is, but like there's things transitioning, and like, and then then few the months go by, months go by, and I just see a lot of people transitioning, like we were just talking about, and it's so wild to me. And for you, you are somebody, Mike, that does create starboards. Well, I don't know if it's a starboard. You create some really cool intrinsic art that is your own art like i just watched your not most recent video which i do want to get into i have a i have a serped from manly p hall that i want to read involving gnomes but the video before that um with your wheel can can you tell us about your star wheel and and this this art that you make and maybe some things that you're seeing uh when you look at things cosmologically like that all right so so i love to make stuff you know and and i'm good and you're I'm an artist. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm self-taught. And the reason I'm self-taught is because um, I don't like I don't I don't like authority, and I don't like being told I'm wrong. And so, if you invent your own stuff, you're always right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's there's such a truth to that for every human being. That's why I told that story. Is like when you invent your own way and you understand the logic behind why you do something, you can't be wrong. So, all right, so the starboard, and so funny you're saying that because I'm in the process right now of um, beginning to, to figure out how to manufacture them so that, because there's such an interest, so many people want them. The starboard is more or less a, uh, it's a, it's a tangible uh, material representation of what you would call the zodiac. And what I do is I have stones that represent the different planets and 
I keep them on the starboard where they would be in the sky. So like, you know, where the sun is, like as it's defined um, in terms of like degrees and constellations, like, you know, that's where the stone, where the sun is and the moon and Mercury and so forth. And usually about every seven days I update it. Um, and what I, I've, I've been, I've been doing the, the, the starboard and working with people and explaining astrology to them for like six or seven years. I mean, I guess you would, it, technically you could call me a professional astrologer and the fact that I would talk astrology and I get paid for it, but it's mostly because um, uh, I think I'm probably a better teacher than I am anything else. I'm really good at explaining like the logic behind that, um, the, the systems and the starboard takes it from like when people he think of or hear of astrology of just being like this abstract idea. And then I could go and point out, I'm like, well, because this is here and this is here and this means that and blah, blah, blah. And it, it becomes a little bit more real. So that being said, uh, over the past like two years, my relationship with astrology has changed a lot and I've moved away from what's basically Babylonian astrology. Like all of our astrology comes from Babylon, the same place which gave us taxes and gave us, gave us like financial systems and human trafficking and all of, the, all of those goodies that regardless of the, what do you guys say, Dan? I was going to say Jesus, but go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, like all of our, <laughs> we, could, we could see like there are certain elements that go throughout empire and we could we, you know at least the history we're told we could trace it there um and so the 12 sign or really any of the the the, the way we we think of the zodiac that's all that's all babylonian but that doesn't mean there's not like something significant with understanding the nature of our realm. And in my opinion, there is nothing more important that for a human being who has ground beneath their feet and sky above their head, there's nothing more important than what they should do than become familiar with their sky and specifically with the, 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 the moving parts of it. Simply for this reason alone, it is the biggest thing that is real. That doesn't mean there's not bigger stuff. It's the biggest thing that is real that you can see with your own eyes. Anything that's bigger than that is going to be a story or it's going to be an abstract, which you're going to have to go and, and like, you know, okay, well, this is what the big bang was, or this is what the, you know, whatever story you want to go with, like, but, 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 but the, the, the planets themselves are, are the, the most real tangible thing which we have to this mystery. And because of that, we should have a relationship for that reason alone. So because of that, I, I continue to use the starboard and I, I would say I even use it with a, greater, with a greater significance than I ever had before. And it's because I want to become immensely familiar with the movement and the rhythm of these planets. And I want to be able to look outside and say like, this is what it looks like on my board. And now I know what I'm looking out in the heavens purely for this one idea is so that my head and my consciousness is aligned to that and not aligned to something else. It's because it's the most real thing. And if I want to get my head out of what I have been born into, I have to bring it into something which is real and not an abstract. So that being said, the starboard is a means of understanding the mechanisms and the movements of, of the heavenly bodies. Now, you, you were talking about time a little bit, a little earlier, Roman, and in my opinion, like, like time's a, time, I, I, I have this course which I'm developing, which is called There's No Such Thing as Monday, and it has to do with the idea like time and all of that stuff not being real, but what is real, what is absolutely real, and what I think really ma matters is timing when things happen relative to each other. Like it does, there's no, like time is, is, doesn't matter, but timing, like that's a real thing. Yes. Um, I, well, I, I don't know if, I think you paused cause, uh, we both got closer to the mic because to yeah, that was like, <laughs> it's a fascinating concept because 
you know, they say that time is not linear. Time is this, time is that. Time is just a construct. Well, it is. It is a construct. It has been constructed. It has been built. It is a format. It is put into a uh, cyclical or cylindrical tube. And then kind of like the starboard, like it's a piece of art that has been created. It's a format. But timing is not something that has been created. And timing is not a construct. Timing is a natural, organic thing that we all attune to. And the planets work with timing and flow. <laughs> and what have you noticed with the movements of the planets, how they flow together right, and their relationship right. and their maybe right, the magnet right, magnetic right, okay, pull okay. and push. You give me such softballs. I love it. <laughs> all right. So this is how I do how I how I set up. And this is why I want to go and and manufacture. Like I've, I I was working with this other dude and he came up with all the plans. And now I'm working with like a laser engraver, like so that we can make these other the thing I made is like by hand and spectacular. That's but amazing. I'm, I'm making something which which is like, you know, for someone who's not going to make something by hand or someone who does want to pay thousands of dollars to have someone make it for them. So, so this is why, because this is the real value of the timing. So this is, you, you could use the starboard in, in as many ways as you can be creative, but this is my most basic level and it fits to your timing. So I have two sets of, let's say planet totems. That's what I call them. So from, from, uh, moon, sun, Mercury, Venus, all the way to Pluto. And I also have like the North node and the South node. And I have them on the board of where they are in real time. And I, I update that on the change of the phase of the moon, which why? Because that's something observable. I can see that with my own eyes. I can identify like when a quarter moon, a full moon or a new moon happens. So I have that set up. My, then, might I just really quickly interject with something just yes. very, very quickly. I, I have to stress this because it just came to my head and I want to let you flow because you're just about to hit something. And I'm right. like, fuck, he's about to go. I got to say, say this it so we can come back to it. Okay. Um, wait, say it again. Say what you're going to say, because I don't want to forget where Jeez. I was going to go. Okay. So, um, it's just really fucking important what he's doing because this is an ancient technology that he's cracked the code on. He's doing this thing that the ancient ancestors were doing with the giant rock slabs, right? This archaeo astrological timing of things. This is something you guys really need to implement into your own lives. Okay, please go, Mike. That's all I need right. to say. So I've got on the starboard, I've got all of the real time placements of the planets and I'm watching them move. And, and watching a move to me is almost more about rhythm than timing, though you can see how they're related because you're getting the feel of like, okay, in, in the, these last <clears throat> seven like sunrise experiences, like this, like Mercury moved eight degrees or something like you feel how much it moves versus like, let's say Venus that moved four degrees and Jupiter that moved one degree or something like, you know what? So you're getting that, but the second part, this is where I think the real gold comes into play. The second set of planets, which I keep on the board, are where the planets were when I was born, aka my natal chart. And the reason why your natal chart is important is because it's the most real thing you have about your relationship with the realm which you're having your physical experience in. You don't have to know anything about any of the stories. If you would just go, like I, I create these things called natural astrology charts, where like if you've ever looked at a natal chart, it looks like hieroglyphics. Well, it's actually telling you really specific information, like where everything is, like the sun is relative to the eastern horizon, all this sort of stuff. And I build that. And it's so you could just look at what the sky looked like when you were born, because that is your time date stamp connection to the realm. And that is the most real thing you have that doesn't mean that there's not bigger things than that but it means that this is where you get your footing before you step off into like whatever if you want to go down a story path and you can do whatever you want to do because that's the the beauty of like you know the free will of your brain is like you get or your mind you get to make those choices but like this is the most real point this is where it begins so you have that on the board and then you begin to see the movements of the planets and then you see it like, oh, wow, this is a, you, you start to recognize there are places in heaven or in the heavens, which are no different than places on Earth. 
Like, you know, you can go and identify a very specific place. Like, you know, this is where this river makes the, where as a confluence with another, uh, with another river. And that's a physical location, no matter how you call it, that's real. That's also true in the sky. And we can, I, it's a little bit more abstract, but we can do that with whatever those white dots are we call stars. And then you begin to realize like, well, I don't know what it means, but I got a, I got a special relationship to that one specific area just because I got a whole bunch of stuff there when I was born and then when you see things are going over there in real time you're like okay I don't really know what that means I'm not going to define it but I know that there's a timing element going on and then you go and you're like well what's going on in my life right now what's going on in my life because this is saying there's something going on now let me go and bring a new awareness so so this is this is to me why this is a a a um a bulletproof approach to like at least looking at your life because I could be telling you all the things I just described, like, well, it's all random, Mike, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to find like significance in something where there's no significance. I'm like, okay, okay. Let's, let's say that's factual. Let's say that's factual, but you still now have brought an awareness and an examination into your life and your environment, which you would not have done before. And you understand why you did that. And an examined life by itself has value. And then the flip side is, oh yeah, this is a perfectly ordered environment. How do you know that? Because like very orderly, like the, the sun rises like pretty predictably and the moon is kind of predictably and like the air is always kind of there. And like, you know, you, you drink enough water pretty predictably, you're going to be pissing pretty soon. And so like, there's all of these things that are kind of predictable in this realm. So I'm going to say like, yeah, the realm is kind of orderly. So I'm going to, I'm going to say like, that's the order I want to go and become attuned to and then surrender to the natural flow of life. So the starboard, like it, 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 it provides that for timing. So you know what you're looking at. We could even go into the chrism in a moment. I think that's the most, the most real timing we can deal with. Uh, uh, but, but it gives you timing. And then it also gives you a, a point of reference in how you physically line up to, uh, to like what we're calling where the sun rises east to where the sun sets uh, west. Uh, what we think of is like, you know, the, the north and the south and all that sort of stuff. Like the working with the starboard also gives you that, uh, it, it, it brings that to, to clarity that all of these, these, these directional points are around you. And you, when you get your bearings, you get your bearings. Okay. So there's, um, there's a lot there, uh, a lot of beautiful goodness there. And something I want to, I want to just, just kind of ask you about since we're on the topic of the, the cosmological goodness. Um, <clears throat> So brother Ross Ben kept bringing up in the past three 40th parallel videos you guys did. It's, it's not a weekend. It's a strong beginning. Okay. It's mm. a strong beginning. And yep. so that made me think about this way that, um, you know, we have this, this, this chart, right? This chart that we call the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. And then, uh, Thor's day, Freya day, Saturn day. So this strong beginning um looking at like this this uh saturnian cosmology which is pretty popular with like the electro uh the electric universe model and the saturnian cosmology and everything makes me think when when the the term strong beginning is said strong beginning starts with saturn day because that was the original sun in saturnian cosmology so, what's that? sunday sunday is the beginning of the week no, no, no! But the strong beginning. Strong beginning. It's a strong, weekend. Like a weekend. So weekend Ross Band was Saturday saying, is what he said. Yeah. So Ro Ross Band was saying that it's not a week end. It's not a an ending of something weak. You know, the week is not weak. It is strong. So a strong beginning. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost kind of like this wordplay I came up with. It was just like, okay, he said it's strong beginning. So what, what's the beginning? Well, the Saturn apparently was the beginning because that was the original sun. And then what follows mm. that is the Sunday. And then it goes into moon day. And so that was just like a funny play on words I thought about. But um, tying into this, the, the cosmic body. Can we stick with the words for the second? Because yes. yes. that's a fascinating conversation. I just want to, because, 
<coughs> the you what when, when when Ross is is it brings up like strong beginning, he's taking back the power of words because the word yes. and that is hmm. that is like that is secondary on the consciousness idea that there's such a thing as a seven day week and that these seven days are tied to whether we want to call it planets or gods or what have you like all of that's a construct that's all a whole bunch mm -hmm. of made up shit but but he's <laughs> taking it back uh he's taking that back with the with the strong with the strong beginning because if you're still going to have to use those seven days and i get it like yeah you're going to still use those seven days at least you could use words which are not disempowering i mean the same thing is like good morning like you know you yes. don't like good like what am i what am i mourning what what you know it's good rising so but so to go back to to your point so where are you going to go with this uh roman i love that and also what i think is funny about those two uh, those two situations right there right you have the weekend and the good morning each of those is like this kind of thing tying back into the timing conversation or this time conversation like this the people who have constructed modern English, okay, let's talk about John D again or Francis Bacon, right? Francis Bacon might have been John D because I'm pretty sure they say Shakespeare is a pseudonym. I'm pretty sure fucking Francis Bacon, who was the guy who created Shakespeare, was also a fucking pseudonym. Yeah, 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 Francis yeah, yeah, yeah. Bacon is not real. He was, it's a whole conundrum of things. Oh, and I like, would love- As soon as you realize none of it's real, then you're like, well, I don't even know where to start. That's when you start questioning <laughs> the nature of the realm. You're like, well, what was, did yesterday even happen? But go on. So where's your point where with the, the language? So, I don't hear where you're going. So this word magic that we're being societally just kind of glued to, right? Like, oh, good morning. It's great to see you. Good morning. You know, like you're, yeah, you're bringing up the fact that, you know, yesterday is dead and it didn't happen. It's done. And it's over. We live in the current now, which I guess is a beautiful thing. But um, th yesterday did happen. And, you know, you, you're not to mourn it. You are to maybe uh, preserve it in your mind and the, and the proverbial pot. But um, I just think it's so interesting that those two things that we brought up there with like the the weekend, the strong beginning and the good morning and the grand rising, it just what are they implementing on us and in our consciousness through these types of words and this timing thing to put us into this construct that we are falling into this this made up construct of time in general and to separate us from this cosmic body. So, so I want to tie this back to uh, something which which uh, Dan commented on a little bit earlier about when he was like, "Yeah, there, there there is a there's a corralling going on right now. We're being moved from one pen to another. You know, we go from like empire to empire to empire, and it changes on the outside. Let's say, and the next one is going to be like a a digital version. But the question <laughs> is like, well, how come?" You know, the more it, it, it changes, the more it stays the same. Like, you know, it's the same Babylonian model thousands of years later. Mm -hmm. And so the reason is, and it's the same thing they say, like, you know, when they talk about Washington, D.C., they're like, you know, the administrations come and go, but nothing ever changes because there's a certain element of like on the most natural level, like of employees who don't you know, leave based upon people who work in the federal government who do not leave when an administration let leaves, like that's what holds in place the, the continuity, if you will, of that system. Well, the same thing is true when we look at the system which we're talking about, whether we want to call it empire or, or, or ball consciousness or what have you, and what holds it in place. It's not, it's, it's not like the really like grand, sexy things like we got to destroy this and destroy the <laughs> Federal Reserve. No, what holds it in place are the languages, the ideas of time, the ideas of number, like the things which you don't even think are things. Yeah. That's what holds it in place. That's the deep state. Fucking mic drop, dude. Uh, That's. I would say it's also our interpretations of these things because not always is our interpretations of these things the correct interpretations and sometimes we are led to believe in certain in, 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 uh, interpretations rather than others and it gives us a societal uh, idea or plan 
uh, based on those ideas because other people from above are telling us that this is the way it's we give me an example true. of of kind of what you're getting at with that because i agree with you and i want to hear where you're going i want to hear your example because i because, because um, there's something there like well we're I'll just bring back like a simple example, like good morning, how we're talking about good morning. Like, why would you mourn uh, something? Uh, why would you say good morning to people? It's like, it's, it's a negative charge to say you're mourning something, right? So even when you're saying good morning, you're still sending a negative vibe, even though what it's really talking about is you're, you're mourning the day before and now you're, you're be becoming so, so, so the, our interpretation of that is, is what I'm talking about is, well, our interpretation of the morning is not necessarily a negative thing, even though it's a negative thing in our vocabulary. Our well, vo I think it, it goes to, yeah. to the word magic, which 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 Roman was talking about, which is we have so many words and so many phonetics and the mm. English language was designed this way on purpose, which have multiple, multiple connotations. And because of that, like the just what you were talking about in terms of there are multiple ways of internalizing, defining, and then expressing uh, uh, what what your inner world definition is of the world, which is, again, why I was saying, like, I want to be done with stories. Every story will deconstruct. Every mm -hmm. single story can be looked at a different way. Um, and you're right. Like whatever, you, as soon as like, if someone's never even thought of before that like good morning actually is making reference to the fact that, that you, you are bringing into your mind, like this idea that I'm in mourning. Um, they're like, I never thought about it. Now it's in my head. And now I'm like, oh, jacked up in my <laughs> head. Like, you know, that kind of screws you up a little bit. And then like, to your point, you're like, well, you know, you're mourning yesterday and yesterday did die. And like, you know, today's the new day. I'm like, well, why are you thinking about yesterday? Because today's today and yesterday's gone. Like you should be in the present. Like, like no matter what, like as soon as we start getting into yeah. any of the stories, like that's when we start spinning. Um, and like, that's where we find ourselves. Like, you know, that's why I like to say there's no such thing as Monday. It's like, none of it's even real. Like we're, we need to have something which we need to, to, to step upon. Otherwise we'd just be a bunch of like meditating, like monks on a, on a, on a, on a mountain. And I want a little bit more action than that, but, <laughs> but like, we need to have awareness. I, to me right now is about awareness and understanding how it works. And then once we are no longer like absolutely clueless and realize like to your point, Dan, about the uh, like your definition defines how you're going to go and take it. Um, yes, there you go. Until until we realize yeah. all of these, the ways in which it works, like we're just foolish. We're just like running around like chickens with our heads cut off. But I think we're learning it. And I think we're learning yeah. this mm -hmm. sort of stuff together. A couple other examples would be like holistic medicine is bad, right? Because you should trust pharmaceutical companies that are making uh, fake versions of the <laughs> of real holistic medicine. So it's <laughs> so it's it's a conundrum, you know. It, it's people telling us what to believe in uh, based on interpretation uh, that they want us to have. It's it's our people switching interpretations uh, to make us think that their interpretation is the correct one uh and, and that's kind of what i was getting at it's this is true in uh yoga too like yoga is awful like why would you do yoga that's like eastern mysticism like you shouldn't be doing that that's uh that's pagan shit or something like that you know it's so this this idea of creating a narrative of even things that are good or seemingly good are actually bad or vice versa and that's interpretation and you can do that with literally every single Everything. thing that every <laughs> that's why i say every story deconstructs because right now there is so, no matter like how perfect you think of something is i guarantee there's someone out there who's like got a really really good reason why it's the exact opposite and that's exactly. when like understanding the mechanics of consciousness is so important is because you realize that it's like what whatever you're going to internalize it as 
as soon as you define like, okay, this is the definition, whether it's a good thing or bad thing or what have you, like you have collapsed the, the, the potentiality of all of the, the other possibilities. So I want to go back to you, like, well, this, this is Mike's personal thought, like you're talking about the holistic medicine and the pharmaceutical medicine and the allopathic and the this and the right. that. I'm like, this is my personal opinion. I'm like, I don't think a single person needs medicine. I think yeah. the idea that you need medicine is the biggest mind fuck of it all. That is so, and it's such, talk about, uh, <clears throat> talk about, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Talk about something that's like really fucking personal and sensitive to people when you start talking about that and i think that's a huge spell that's been going on this past year because they know that like don't talk about politics and religion at the dinner table well don't talk about <laughs> who can take what medicines or not because when there's people's families at stake if you fucking badger people who are taking these medicines because they're trying to get their grandpa healthy you are the biggest piece of shit in the world because how fucking dare you how dare you i'm trying to get healthy it's like but George, it's a spell it's a fucking spell yeah. damn it you're right about the medicine it is a real like <laughs> like well 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 you anything the deeper the identification with whatever the thing is, the more someone's going to defend it. Like that's the yeah, nature of, exactly. of, of how it is. And then there's certain things which, which are really uh, in our culture in this time, which have been um, uh, uh, forced upon us so heavily that the identification is really taken a deep, deep level. And you're right. Like the, the, the medication and like the, the death, and like all this sort of stuff, like, you know, well, guess what? Like maybe, maybe, maybe they should die. Uh <laughs> okay. I, I wanna I wanna touch on this and then I wanna wrap it kind of back into some syncretism. Okay. All right, all um, right. Okay, so <clears throat> this uh I you know, obviously the people that that are the string pullers of society are very well adept of cosmology, right? Because our ancient ancestors were very adept in cosmology. They have been studying the stars. They and and occultism and esotericism follows mysticism, right? It, it follows the stars. There's been uh, any major uh, quotes too that say like uh, millionaires don't have astrologers, billionaires do. Okay, it is tied into it. So they study the stars. And when you look at like this, this indoctrination that's happened on this level to get us to the point to where we're at, we're ripping each other's throats out for having just opinions in general. Uh, I think what they know that we are coming into this age of Aquarius, you know, this, 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 this potentiality of great awakening. And so they had to basically set in stage a long time ago, this plan to basically put all these things in motion to get us to the point to where we're so fucking indoctrinated by this time when there would be a great upheaval or great, some sort of societal awakening, which I do think is still happening that we get to the point that, that they get to win because their 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 plan has been set into play as opposed to and they're battling the cosmic they're battling cosmology they're they're bat they're playing against the odds and they're doing syncretism on a cosmic level and so that's that little tangent i want to um bring this back into cause or uh syncretism which is you know i which you know is stacking of cultures right and so what you studied with the Sesquihana River alchemy, uh, you know, and you were looking at syncretism, how the Masons came over here, whatever type of, you know, whatever club that they were in came over here and knew exactly where they were going to set things up, why they were going to set it up that way and had a plan with it. So you talked about earlier about the, the, the cosmology and the heavens aligning down here on earth. And we know that through the pyramids of Giza, the mound building cultures, the pyramid building cultures of the text down below and, and Southern, Southern America and the Vedics, right? And it basically every everywhere except for fucking Europe and European people <laughs> that have been building things, you know, maybe the cathedrals, but that was after they they found that out afterwards, right? It's all been ripping off of Eastern mysticism and these true I call it the true root of existence, which is like 
which is Eastern stuff. You know, that's just, that's just my opinion. I, you know, um, being a white guy, it's like, damn it, dude. I like wish I was anything else besides white a lot of times side tangent. But anyways, what have you seen that and, and noticed and maybe what do you think this ultimate goal and plan is and was with coming over here and setting up these stations and setting up these things and going over mounds, ripping mounds out to stack on top of these mounds? And are they aligning with these heavens to come down here? And and yeah, so like, is that that's a long winded question? So is so there a question in there? Mostly like about like the mound <laughs> stuff. That's that's my question too because you know okay so because there's a couple ways I could go with that so we could talk about the uh, uh, the mounds like well the first thing which which I think uh, was a a really valid point which you brought up was that the story that we're told of how how uh, what we're calling North America was colonized starting in the 1600s. So what I mean is like, assuming like there was no one coming over here before, like, I don't, oh. I obviously think there was like, I don't think that's, that's, <laughs> the, that's what, I don't even know what happened, but I know that there are two different con- stories that don't line up, but we're mm-hmm. going to go with the mainstream story. The yeah. mainstream story is peppered if you're paying attention with all sorts of indications like yeah these cats knew exactly where they're going what they're looking for and they're they're setting that up so that is that is a a a seemingly evident self-evident truth if you're paying attention um particularly on the east coast of of the united states um but then there's this idea and this really gets into ross's er uh, area of expertise is the way of of human beings you know we're we're not separate from this realm you know now we might feel that way but we're still like you know we're we're part of what we call earth like you know we are we are integrated with it and part of that connection which we have as human beings is that we have connection with, through blood and through our ancestors and in the same ways that um like in a forest if it when a tree fells and and you want it to 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 in in its natural environment over a long period of time you know years uh the, the tree decomposes back into the ecosystem, returning all sorts of like information and nutrient, like, like it's perfect. And so when the human being lived in a way with their environment, like both in terms of like how their dead return to the earth and the blood and like, just like, you know, all of all of our shit and piss going into the area, like the land where we were living versus like everything being encapsulated in the system, which is completely disconnected from like the environment, like those are feedback loops. And so we were part of that. And so the history deals with the, the, the disconnecting the human being from that. Like we can't imagine, we can only imagine, and I don't think we can imagine uh, well of how, what it must have been like to live in a relationship with the environment of earth where like we had that level of connection because we don't have it now. Like you could be more connected than like an urban, like a, someone who's living on the 15th floor of a, of an urban building, but, but we, it's different. It's so different now. And so when, when the mounds were destroyed, when the people were moved off of their land, you know, and this is a big part of empire building is to move the people off their land. It's like, oh, you got this land here. Well, I'm just going to move you 500 miles away. It's not because I necessarily want the land which you're on. It's that I don't want you connected anymore because that's where your strength comes from. And so there's that. So the 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 utilizing of the mounds and then a lot of it is a. Uh, is the rebuilding on the mounds is almost like like uh, being lazy. Well, I know there's something significant happening right here, so I'm going to build on top of it. And sometimes it's just seemingly like people are ignorant. They don't even know what they're doing. And, I, and, and this is why I'm saying that. 
in Ohio, like particularly like Ohio, Tennessee, like that area of the United States, there's so many like huge mound complexes, some of them stretching like 70, 80 miles. And it wasn't like they were they were systematically destroyed. It was just like, you know, people built on them. And like, you know, you've got like, you've got something in the middle of a golf course, like not like some golf courses were purposefully, particularly on the Eastern seaboard, purposefully mound and holy sites or, or, or important sites were turned into golf courses. And then like more in the Midwest, you just see it like accidentally, or at least it appears that way. Um, oh, look who's coming in right now. Brother eyes. Right on cue. So finish that thread. Mr. So Wong. where I was where I was going with that is and, and I think it's perfect because we got the expert. Look who look who we got. What's oh. up? <laughs> What's Yo, up? Blame, blame it on the retrograde, man. I apologize. I know Mercury <laughs> went direct, but I've just been glitched out all weekend, man. My apologies. No worries, no worries brother. Man. It's we good appreciate to see you your showing face up. And hear your voice and your timing is perfect because they're asking me about mounds. And I'm like, you know, like I, I got a thing or two I could say, but I'm not the expert. Mm. And so as soon as we had that conversation, you show up. So so it's it's the timing yeah. is perfect. All right, awesome. <laughs> well. <laughs> Do we want to just jump right in and like start keep all the conversation going, or should we pause for a little bit and 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 have a smoother Acclimate. transition into the, into the conversation? You speaking to me? I'm speaking to the yeah. hosts. Yeah, let's oh. uh, well let let's uh let's let's maybe acclimate a little bit and say uh say hello, Ross. How how are you doing, sir, <laughs> Ross Ben? Greetings, love and respect. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it. Uh, it's uh. You know, it's it's never it's never too late, man. Uh, you know, the time we were talking about timing earlier and that time itself, mm -hmm. that construct thing, you know, may or may not exist. But timing is what exists. And you have proven that here today, um, All right. you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing, man. We've been we've been we've been we've been uh we've been studying up on you guys in the 40th parallel and uh you know the brothers and the mystics of the the 40th parallel so this is dope well give thanks i have to admit doing this 40th parallel work is some of the funnest thing i've been doing in my adulthood man wow yeah it's fun awesome. i love it i've been thoroughly <laughs> enjoying this, this journey with mystic mike you know it has it yeah. has been so much fun and to me this is this is what tickles me is when Ooh. i see other people like the sparks going off in people's eyes yes yes and yes. you're like and i'm like i i don't and it, it's so surprising like to be like wow look how this is resonating with people look how their thought like how thought thinking and thought patterns like 10 years ago people didn't think this way and now they do yep shapers man you guys are are, are are shapers of the the malleability of reality like that mm. th that that proverbial conscious goop that is there the play-doh uh which is interesting right we got play-doh and then we have plato and plato himself mm. told these stories and which are like they're they're set in stone but they're still malleable because he put them out. Like it's almost as if he was such a mystic that he knew that these stories were going to be held onto for thousands of years. Mm. And, uh, you know, and we spoke about this earlier too, like this consciousness is malleable and we are able to create our reality. And, you know, this, this timing of where we choose to go, through our timing is what is so relevant in our lives and when you open your into your guided intuition you are just led down the most beautiful path with the light from shining above you know and and below and um what is the name of your book i i, I didn't want to butcher it but it's like it's such a beautiful play There's on five words books. oh books. the the uh the one that's like ugh. on mounds for your uh, mound and your mind will follow that one i love mouth. that i love that dude that is such a good name well you know 
Uh, I have to be honest. All right, I'm a Parliament Funkadelic. <gasps> uh, <spoken not laughs> Uncle George! Day, right? <laughs> and you know, that one of the uh, classic Funkadelic albums from back in the day was Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. Right? <laughs> so, which I feel like there's some deep metaphysics behind that because we know mm -hmm. the subtle informs the denser you know so that's real like if you free your mind which is the one of the mm -hmm. most subtlest realms of our, of your existence then yeah your ass is gonna follow which is the densest you know <laughs> so uh <laughs> i uh i just played on that with free your mouth and your mind will follow and originally to be totally honest man I'll tell you how momentum works because it was the name of a presentation at, a, at the Free Your Mind Conference, Free Your Mind Conference. Uh, <laughs> that's what even got me on that play on words because I said, well, hey, if I'm gonna do a presentation at the Free Your Mind Conference, let me have that a part as the theme of, of the title, you know? But, uh, I, that was the first presentation I did at a Free Your Mind conference. I can't remember the year. I want to say maybe 2013, 2014, around there. But man, so much momentum. That, that presentation set off so much momentum, you know, beyond just having me invited forward to more Free Your Mind conferences. But this, the discussion, the research, the networking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it evolved into the book, you know. How yeah. many of the Free free Your Mind conferences were there? Were there two or three? Well, there was one before I became a part of it. And I was a part of four. So I want to say there was five in total. There were five in total. And they were, they were all in the Philadelphia area, correct? They were all in the Philadelphia area. The first two or three were like really Philadelphia because even the organizers were rooted here. Mark Passio and uh, like his collective. Uh, right, Katie right, Parker. right. But then... Uh, you know, they they didn't want to make it an annual event. They wanted it to be biannual because it's a lot. It was a lot of logistics and organizing. But then you had a lot of people who were like, yo, to keep the momentum, it's got to be an annual thing. So the Philadelphia crew, they kind of released control of it because they were like, we're not up to doing it annually but we're not gonna fight this momentum either. So uh, that's kind of how that unfolded, you know? Have you know ever met what, Uncle George before? I... I'm sorry? Oh, say, have you ever met Uncle George before? Uncle George Uncle... Clinton? No. Oh, man. <laughs> I wish I would've, you know? Idols. When I was a youth, one time they came to DC uh, for like maybe uh, it was a multiple concert, uh, multiple date concert. And so one of the days they came to a park in DC, like just, you know, like signing autographs and meeting fans. So I met uh, Bernie Worrell and uh, Fuzzy Haskins. So I met a couple of the, you know, original Funketeers, but not George Clinton himself. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge funk fan and, and P-Funk, you know, all of the P-Funk, everything within the P-Funk universe is like absolute, you know, absolute real. And then I think it goes, uh, what follows a Graham Central Station right after that, and uh, then uh, 
Slide Stones in that mix. Yeah, Slide. No, Slide. Slide is probably number three. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, I, but dude, there's so much P funk that it's just like you can just get lost in that realm forever. But um, I do apologize, Mike. I interrupted uh, by asking that question. What were you gonna say, my brother? Um, if you were to ask me that two minutes ago, I'd respond. But we now talking about gone. free your know. mind. We were talking about the free your mind conference. Uh, oh, yeah. I was saying it was the free your mind. That's when I first became uh, aware of your work, Ross. Uh, yeah. Seeing the the replay on on YouTube, and uh, I was I remember I was a fa I was I I used to listen to a lot of Pasio's work, like in that time period, like in the uh, probably like pre twenty twelve is when I think I when when I used to listen to a lot of his stuff, like back when it, uh, I what was the name I I don't even remember what the name of his podcast was, but but this is what like in a, the world a is on happening that. maybe. Yes, yes, yes. I remember like like listening to it back when it was double digits. Like I remember yeah. that. And then once once I became aware of it, I was like, I got to go to this thing. And then it just stopped happening because I was I was an hour or so away living in Lancaster. Right. Who the good old but Lancaster days. Like, what, what's funny is what's so interesting is how that has like, look at what we just did a month or so ago in Pittsburgh. And then what we're going to do again in August in uh, the Myco Fest is really it began from from that from that free your mind like this, this is what i'm telling moved. you man that presentation set off so much momentum in my life that uh you know it, I, I would i would have to say it definitely changed the trajectory of my life just in terms of right i linked with you i linked with so many other different people and networks and uh schools of thought from doing that Free your mind, free your mind, free your mound, and your mind will follow presentation. You know, <laughs> you and when you think about like what 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 those two things are, like you've got like as you said, like we're we're dealing with the idea of 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 mound and mound technology and free your mind and all of that, but then it's also like like linked in the actual soil of Philadelphia, the Wissahickon, and everything that happened there, and and. We, we were taught, we mentioned this before you came, when, before you joined us, Ross, was how, how much like both the Susquehanna mystery, which was highly influenced by what I, listening, if I didn't listen to you, I probably never would have like talked to anyone beside my neighbor on it. But then I was like, okay, <laughs> there's weight here. And that came from that presentation, me watching you say that. And then what you and I have done with this 40th parallel thing and how that's touched people, it all goes back to that, like yeah. in terms of topic and place. And, and like to tie it in, you know, the, the, that particular conference was in Center City, Philadelphia at a very geomantically energized spot. It was like maybe one or two blocks from where the six ley line convergence point in Philly is. And I think I mentioned uh, as a part of that presentation, that the fact that this Free Your Mind conference is occurring here, you know, like Lenape tradition about that region of like, you know, and I say that even though I'm in Philly, I'm speaking specifically about Center City, you know, they say what happens there happens with the full participation of the earth. And mm. You know, we could see how the that free your mind, free your mound and your mind will follow presentation has resonated and is resonating out, you know, just kind of reaffirm what you're saying. And we were we were also talking we were talking about a whole bunch of stuff before you came. Yeah, and, we went down. We I, went down I, I went rabbit holes. I went down on a on a on a tangent talking about like it is there is a real like tangible like change which is happening right now and like people are really jumping off of this old way and they have to otherwise we're being corralled in this other pen that is like the that what 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 I was talking about is one hundred percent from uh, uh, the byproduct of what you're talking about the beginnings of these ideas and this freeing of of literally our minds of how we understand ourselves 
how we understand culture, how we understand our relationship to the land, to each other, to everything. So that once that's free, well, then we can start, you know, your ass will follow. Exactly. <laughs> We're witnessing it. We, right? we really are. <laughs> we are slow, but steady. Yeah, and, I mean that was what 2013 you said. So that would be that. That's like we're coming up on 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 ten years next year. I on suppose ten years. Yeah. We're at nine years now. This is the end of that, that that cycle. If you want to go with the with the Deca cycle. Yes. That's jazz. That's jazz snaps for you guys. This beautiful decade of <laughs> of goodness right there. Yes, because if it wasn't for that, and I want to say it sounds like an egregore. Like you created this path. You created your reality through the malleability. You, you said, hey, free your mound and your mind will follow. And then the momentum came from that at the top of the mound down through, you know, top of the mount to Zion. Boom. Mm -hmm. Let's snowball into Babylon and whoops, you're done. Now, let me ask you this. Yeah. So when we're talking about the mounds, okay, I kind of had this, this, this vision pop in my head. <clears throat> ant mounds and ant hills. Okay. And then mm. talking about indigenous culture, uh, culture, there's a lot of, you know, inner earth, uh, uh, talk. And there's this, you know, that these, these deities that were of ants, right there, or they were like yeah. represented as ants like and ant I'm, people and all of that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so we were talking before, um, when we're getting into the mound stuff about, the cosmological like connection between the heavens and the grounds. And we were creating this, uh, this map of the, of the cosmos here. And then you have the syncretic, like European classic empire building society that comes and basically is pretty much aware of all of all of their cosmological understandings with the mound buildings. Right. And they, they know that there's a connection between there's a reason why they're built where they're built. There's a reason why, and they need to, uh, they need to, to stamp it out and to put it on top to either harness the energy or what have you. But, um, <clears throat> I guess the point I'm getting at is, you know, in cities, we're kind of like ants, right? We are kind of like ants. There's a lot of us. We're building this, we're building this anthill. We're building this society, you know, and we're all working together for this, you know, the, the queen, right? Or the, for the king. High, right. For the collective. Right. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. where, where does this, where does like the, ma this is like a kind of a big question. Sometimes I really have an issue like making questions out of long rants. I'm like, dude, there was no questions involved in that. But so let me try here. Um, <clears throat> where does this, these ant deities and in ancient indigenous culture and this concept of syncretism, do they tie in together at all? <laughs> hmm. Excellent question. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I could speak on Kemet, the Nile Valley, and the Dogon in terms yeah. of uh, they definitely had a vision of an underworld, you know? And, and actually, just like there, there was considered to be seven heavens, there were seven realms within an underworld, you mm -hmm. know? And, seven hells. Uh, yeah, se seven hells, exactly. And, uh, you know, it was inhabited. And you know how ants live underground. And when an ant mm -hmm. colony comes to the surface, right, there'll be like a, a little mound or a little hill mm -hmm. that marks the entrance of where the ants come uh, to the surface and, and, and go back subterranean. So yeah. the original uh, step pyramids, particularly of Saqqara mm. in Egypt, uh, or, you know, Kemet, as well as uh, many of the, you know, there were many step mounds in Central and Western Africa that were just kind of eliminated or uh, 
you know, just wiped out. So that historic legacy connecting Kemet to the rest of the continent was minimized, you know? But uh, I relate that uh, parallel of, of the mounds to anthills because I really do think it speaks to like in Kemet and as well as the Dogon, they had a deeper connection to the occupants of the underworld, you know? And yeah, when the Hopi talk about the ant people too, we always, in my mind, I always think of people from underground and I never really think about the mounds as being like a part of that idea, but the mounds are basically a part of that whole ant people idea is that they, they're coming out from the mounds and that you, that that's the ant hole and their society is within that underneath. Exactly. It's fascinating. Exactly. And then, there, and then that brings up a mystery about many of the cities we live in. Mm. Okay. Uh, you get to these cities and there are these vast underground tunnels that, you know, were these tunnels pre-existing? Were the tunnels here or were they built in to be part of the city? Are you talking like subway tunnels or are you talking about something else or? or... Uh, I'm talking about something else. I mean, they, some of them look like- Subterranean. Uh, yeah. Well, some I'm wondering, them... are like the, I've always wondered were the subway tunnels like part of like what you, yeah. maybe what you're referring to, like a, a pre-existing uh, a network, which has just been modernized or, or I also know like the, the ones they talk in LA about in LA where the, where all of the, 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 the children oh. sacrifice and all that stuff was happening in the in... 80s. In yeah. Portland, we had the, uh, the the thing called the Shanghai Tunnels, and they would have tours of the Shanghai Tunnels. And it, it was like no cars would fit through them or anything, but that's also where another human trafficking uh, thing, not to get all like crazy dark with it, but yeah, like there's that's, and that's on the West Coast. And the West Coast and the East Coast got a completely different type of syncretic vibe going on. But I just wanted to throw that in there, that it, it's also up in and the And that's city. the thing, right? You go to cities like... All right, if you put a chronology on West Coast cities, mm -hmm. they're hundreds of years younger than East Coast cities. Yeah. Right. But then you they still got these fully developed subterranean networks. Where, where, who had time to dig all that out? You know <laughs> what I mean? So that's another dimension, I think, to when we talk about ant people, the legacy of the ant people in this mo these, this modern reality we're living in, you know? Shit. Yo, Uncle Mike, Another I want to... I want to ask you because we've been going for a couple hours. Like, what are, are uh, what your timeline is and how you're feeling and and what your vibe is? Because I don't want to. Uh, I just I just settled in again, so it's like nice. You know, I, I, I I was I I I mentally and emotionally committed to nine o'clock, but but now that Ross is here, I'm going to stay a little bit longer because <laughs> this is good. We, it's it's not common that we get to have this this type of exchange. So I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. Oh, okay, that's and a pleasure. For, I, I will say too. I tuned into a couple of your episodes just to see, like, you know. If we're legit who, or not. Who, yeah. yeah, who am I going to be building <laughs> with? And uh, I really appreciate your angle on you. a lot of different subjects, you know. And thank you for Thanks, man. having me uh, be a guest. Well, it's an honor. It's an honor yeah, to have both of you guys here. No doubt. No doubt. Hey, can I, can I read you guys something? Uh, this is, this is uh, dedicated to Mike here in the Gnome countryside, but then now we're talking about the mounds and the ant people. This has got me thinking about some other shit. So um, this is a serped from Manly P Hall's book. And this is like kind of talking about the elementals, um, these entities that dwell. Uh, they're not necessarily spirits, but they dwell within the elements and they're these, 
these uh these creatures and um i uh i'm gonna i'm gonna start it you guys you guys down yeah yeah Go okay so the elementals who dwell in that of the attenuated uh attenuated body of the earth which is called the terraris ether are grouped together under the general heading of gnomes the name is probably derived from the greek genomus meaning the earth dweller just as there are many types of human beings evolving through the objective physical elements of nature, so there are many types of gnomes evolving through the subjective ethereal body of nature. These earth spirits work in an element so close to the vibratory rate of the material earth that they have immense power over its rocks and flora and also over the mineral elements in the animal and human kingdoms. Some, like the pygmies, work with the stones, gems, and metals and are supposed to be the guardians of the hidden treasures. They live in caves far down in what the Scandinavians call the land of the Nibelungen. In Wagner's wonderful opera cycle, The Ring of Nibelungen, Alberic makes himself king of the pygmies and forces these little creatures to gather for him the treasures concealed beneath the surface of the earth. Besides the pygmies, there are other gnomes who are called the tree and forest sprites. To this group belong to the Sylvesters, the Satyrs, Pans, Dryads, Hamidryads, the Duralis, Elves, Brownies, and little old men of the woods. <coughs> Paracelsus states that the gnomes build houses of substances resembling their constituencies, alabaster, marble, cement. But the true nature of these materials is unknown, having no counterpart in physical nature. Some families of gnomes gather in communities, while others are indigenous to the substances with and in they work. For example, the hamidryads live and die with the plants or trees of which they are a part. Every shrub and flower, it is said to have its own nature spirit, which often uses the physical body of the plant as its habitation. The ancient philosophers, recognizing the principle of intelligence manifesting itself in every department, of nature alike believe that the quality of natural selection exhibited exhibited by creatures not possessing organized mentalities expressed in reality the decisions of nature spirits themselves the classic myth says it was a pleasing trait in the old paganism that it loved to trace in every operation of nature the agency of deity the imagination of the Greeks, people who regions of the earth see with divinities to whose agency it attributed the phenomena that our philosophy ascribes to the operation of natural law. Thus, in behalf of the plant it would work with, the elemental accepted and rejected food elements, deposited coloring matter therein, preserved and protected the seed, and performed many other benefic uh, beneficent offices. Each species served by a different but appropriate type of nature spirit. Those working with the poisonous shrubs, for example, were offensive in their appearance. It is said that nature spirits po of poison and hemlock resemble closely tiny human skeletons, thinly covered with a uh, semi-transparent flesh. They live in and through the hemlock. If it be cut down, remain with the broken shoots until both die. But while there is the slightest evidence of the shrub, it shows the presence of the elemental guardian. That's mm. mm. uh, because Mike, you posted this video while you're in the, the river and there is like these things that popped up out of the rocks. And I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Can, can I talk about that for a second? Yes, man. All right. Uh, does it have, so the, the video, which you're talking about, um, so I'm, I'm at a place called Gnome Countryside. So Gnome Countryside is kind of like an attraction for children. It's been called one of the top five children's attractions in Pennsylvania. And it may be like 15, 10 acres. And it's interesting in the fact that it's in Amish farm country, but it's this swath of, of, of wooded area, uh, which is which feels very, very like forested um, amongst a more agricultural setting. And what you have here is uh, it's been around, it's been op in operation for 35 years and it's these beautiful hand carved manicured trails through this wooded area, which is um, 
The reason why it's wooded as opposed to being farmland is because it's where the um, where the creek and the streams are and it's very hilly here so it's kind of like where the ridges where the water goes between the ridges and at the end of the day like it's not easy to farm so it's like yeah yeah we're not going to turn this to farmland it was kind of left as it was protect the watershed by keeping the forest around the the, the streams exactly it's 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 this all riparian buffer and and it's 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 beautiful and so like that's kind of like where how it began and it's it's this really kind of like nice magical place for people to go and and have like it's often the first uh a wilderness experience for a lot of children in this general area so that's like kind of like the the cover story if you will or that's the the way it's kind of known and and um it has a very strong gnome sort of quality to it but for the most part it's done tongue-in-cheek like it's done beautifully but it's done tongue-in-cheek it's not um like it's kind of like you know are you if you have you seen any gnomes i'm still looking for gnomes but you know <laughs> it's called gnome countryside and there's something else to it so that being said in this place there's what it's beautiful and there's one particular location which is probably in the heart of the property and it's it's in the canyon it's in the lowest part where like the the um where where there's a confluence i think of of just like the a main creek called the octoro and and a creek that runs a beautiful waterfall that runs through uh gnome countryside and that's where um i've been going i've been staying here for about three weeks now and every day i'll go down there for a couple hours and it's become kind of like uh, it's obvious this would be the where anyone would want to go uh and spend time and it occurred to me, I really haven't been putting out much content lately, but I, I kind of like, I wanted to do something. So I just brought a camera down there and I turned it on and didn't really think much of it. And I wanted to see what would, what would unfold. I was thinking or un, uh, come out of it. And I thought maybe I'll like squeeze it down into like a minute or two. Cause I always think that looks cool. And once I got the video back or the film, or I started looking at it afterwards, I, I'm scrolling through it and I see there's this one part where I like walk into the, um, into the creek. I set up a chair like on a, on a pretty big rock, which is um, just above the surface of the water, probably like a five foot uh, by five foot surface area of the rock and it's maybe like six inches off the water. I set up a, um, a chair there and you could see in the video that I'm, I'm standing in some sort of like contemplation in the in the water. It's my favorite thing to do. You stand in the water. It's beautiful and just kind of whatever. Like I'm 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 clean. I'm literally doing the brainwashing of all of like the, the toxic culture, which we're, we're, we're inundated with all the time. And in the video, I can see like, as I'm doing this, like these, these dots, these white dots, they, they appear over my head, the, these orbs, you know, that's what they used to call them. The, the orbs are in the video. And I start looking at it more closely. And what, what happens is not only do they appear, not only do they appear, but um, the timing of that corresponds with my behavior. And so what you see is I'm standing in the water, I'm in contemplation, I then walk over and sit in the chair on the, sit on the chair on the rock. And then I'm just sitting on the chair, just, I don't know what I'm thinking. I don't remember any of this. Like, you know, it happened. Like, I don't know when this happened uh, in terms of like, it was, it was a full day and I was on the rock many times or what have you. Um, as soon as the first orb appears, I bend over and I pick up a notebook. And then the second orb appears. This is like probably four minutes. So for four minutes, I'm sitting with a notebook in my hand and I'm kind of like just in, in, my, in where I, whatever's going on in my head, I'm sitting there. The second orb appears and they're like really sh like striking, like in terms of how crisp the image shows itself in, in the video. And then they disappear. They, cut, they, they, they disappear. And the moment they disappear, I start writing furiously. Now I did that like for whatever reason, like like I, I picked up a notebook and probably thought of some stuff. And then like, and when I was ready, I started writing what I was going to write. But, and I didn't know that there were orbs over my head. 
Now, I don't know what these orbs are. I mean, maybe they're sun flares. Uh, I think it looks more like an uh, like a uh, or a sun flares, a uh, camera like the lens flares on the uh, on a camera. Like you know, yeah. maybe it's that. I don't want to name it. I don't want to get into that conversation because that takes away from the timing of the fact that whatever, however, what that was, it appeared at this perfect time in this known place. And I will say this with an app with absolute certainty before I saw any of this i always feel like i'm being watched while i'm Mm. down there for Mm. whatever that may mean maybe that's just a subjective feeling but uh i don't feel that frequently and i definitely felt it uh feel it when i'm down there whether they're gnomes or not i don't know but if there's going to be gnomes i think that's going to be the place where i'm going to find them yeah what did you write in the book um you really want to know oh yeah man Give us right, a, give I mean, review. give me, give me the, one second. It, it's, it's worthy of reading. <laughs> so it, if there's a deep connection there that connects into something, you know, interesting, that'd be uh, pretty incredible. Um, uh, I did hear, uh, I think it was Juan when he was talking to Mark on, a, on one of the shows uh, that Gnome is connected to Nomad. Mm, yeah. And Gnosis, maybe, because it's got the GN. <clears throat> and then I was thinking, I was I was using some more word magic, too, and that's a uh, genome. Hmm. Oh, well, <clears throat> so what's interesting about that Manly P. Hall serped, and it's a great book. I, I, I suggest, I mean, what, what written by Manly P. Hall isn't awesome, right? Like, it's <laughs> inevitably just, like, the most esoteric shit you'll ever read. But, um it's like gnomes and like nomenclature, right? Like culture, gnome, genome. It's like nomad, nomad. Exactly. And so there's like this, it's always been there. We've always known about these spirits and the, and and like you said, the vibratory rate at which they exist. Most times it's always, we've always known about these spirits and there's (laughs) no gnome place like gnome. (laughs) Wordplay is fun. The all know me. <laughs> all right, you're all back, right. Mike. What you got? What you got? All right, all right, all right. So, so this is the notebook. Ooh. And uh, I'm a notebook guy. I got a lot of notebooks. Notebooks have different purposes mm-hmm. for me. All right. And so this was the page. Oh. And I know this because I looked at the video and I saw how I was holding the notebook. And there are only two pages I wrote that day. And I wrote this. And it all like kind of. Um, wow. I mean, I, I just, it just seemed like normal writing when, when I was writing it. Like, it's not like I'm thinking gnomes are whispering in my ears. So I'm not implying that, but I'm also saying that did not, not happen. I'm just saying like, this is what I wrote down. <laughs> Maybe they absorbed into your, your, uh, your auric bubble. <laughs> Maybe I am a gnome. All right. <laughs> this is what, this, this is, this is what came out uh, from there right now, the potential for a materialized radically different new reality is great we are in the midst of a transition into something very different than what anyone has yet experienced future human expression will be unrecognizable to what you know so that means stop thinking about the future it is outside of your imagination Mm. at least it is now Any ideas you hold are likely built on matrix foundation. What is unfolding will come out of this, what we are in now. And what we are in now is sick, demented, backwards, inverted, and more. (laughs) In the physical realm we inhabit, all decaying matter at some point becomes the substance of life, beauty, and regeneration. Think about that in terms of the human experience, individually and collectively. At some point, the decay is realized for what it is, and then it is left for something better. As the worlds, individually and collectively, continue to collapse, the something better life moves on to is identifiable because the lessons learned from the collapse are applied. You don't want to go through that shit again. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you understand how to get how it got to be that way and you don't and you know what is required not to be that way 
Now is the time to repair what has been spoiled. For a human, that means the transition does not just require courage, but an immense amount of humility, compassion, forgiveness to yourself and to everyone else. Massive Fabulous, healing. Man. Massive Fucking healing. Isn't that I will been, say this. I don't uh, normally write like that. Wow. Hasn't that, That's hasn't not that your also typical been... voice, huh? That's not my typical writing voice. No. Wow. Wow. Hasn't and it was written been... like it was, it was not like I mean, you know, Roz, you write like you write and you like you edit and you scratch it and you play with like the syntax. Like that was just written like that. Hmm. Amazing. What are you gonna say, Dan? Oh, it's it's also kind of been a, a summary of of what we've been talking about on the show too. The, Absolutely. The timing. Yeah, so far in this episode, the, all the things that we have been talking about, the transitions mm -hmm. that life has uh, been going through is all occurring right now at this time. There's a huge transition, and uh, that's it's fascinating, man. Fascinating. What about you, uh, Ross? Yeah, what that's you... why I kind of jumped at the, the opportunity to read it because I was like, yeah, like that was, like when I watched that story, I'm like, wow, that's, you know, that, that, that's an intro that that's, that's yeah. It's there's, there's some meat on that bone. Oh yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, thou shalt savor the, 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 the fruits of the labor right there. Uh, <laughs> I hope that, I hope that you get a chance to expand on that and maybe, um, you know, uh, more writings like that will come to you because that was fucking beautiful. And it, it is crazy how synchromistically it does tie into this. I, I mean, whether or not it's like fresh on your consciousness or, you know, it's just part of the, like maybe you were literally absorbing uh, cause you were oh, mega grounding right there. You were mega grounding in the water. You were mega right. grounding in a spiritual place. Right. And here's something else that's interesting too with with the waters, right? I mean, you know yeah. this from the Susquehanna River alchemy, right? Like there's this ancient canal system that's been built by the indigenous people and a lot of these a lot of these waterways may or may not be naturally glacially or glacially created. And I, it's not that I don't necessarily believe like a, you know, uh the geologist and and the scientist telling us about the 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 um you know, these deluges and the uh, <clears throat> the younger dryest period and and all of that. But um, when we talk to Corey Daniels, you know, he's going to be also on the syncret syncretism month. He told us about these canal ways down in Arizona that were built by the indigenous people that are so fantastically advanced canal systems that you, you know, you're just like, how how could they do this without some sort of technology? Right. And so you know talking about these these ley lines the magnetic energies the goodness of the of of the connecting of the cosmos and the heavens here on earth you were tapped in and then the same fucking time in the video you have orbs coming and then they go away and then boom you have a fucking download yes. right i know it's right. kind of funny right right <laughs> it's smoke yeah, I wanted to ask you, Ross, because I, I watched your uh, presentation on the your 2022 predictions and um, also your 2021 predictions last year. But this year, you know, now that we're here in the now, um, speaking of the now, um, is that kind of what you got the vibe of that is like transitions this year? Or what, what What's going on with your predictions and, and where do you think we're at on that, bro? Well... We're in a window where we can make a lot happen, yes. Um, as far as 2022, uh, Jupiter, Neptune, alignment and Pisces was the big uh, portal that, you know, could, if we tapped into it properly, we could really changed the trajectory of this pandemic and all of that, you know? But to be honest, that window has, the window of that exact portal has already gone. Oh. You know, uh, I think April, by begin by mid-May or the beginning of May, Jupiter is already in the Aries. And it is gonna go retrograde and go back into Pisces. But Jupiter 
retrograde is not easy, particularly if you're trying to move forward and, you know, I think Jupiter getting slowing down and getting ready to go retrograde is why we're seeing all the economic inflation and deflation and just the value of things going up and down, you know? But 2023, we got a couple of things happening. One is gonna be 40 years after the Philadelphia experiment. Oh. And if you know, like when you study uh, Preston Nichols and Al Beliak and all them cats that, you know, say they were part of it, right? One of the things they say is that that August 12th, 1943 was not like a random choice. That it was, that date was selected because, and I'm actually wrong, it's 80 years after. Uh, not 40 years, right? But, it's the uh, second 40. Yeah, it's the mm. second 40. Thank you. Because there was, a 40, there was a 40 year there link. There was a from 40 in 83. And here comes the second 40. And at that first 40, it is said that's when they jumped off Montauk. That, that's like there was a, a there's a 40 year cycle that the uh and this cycle is related to the magnetic field of the earth supposedly that philadelphia experiment like it had to occur that august 12 43 to be on the right uh right alignment with this magnetically this magnetic cycle of the earth and it's a 40 year cycle. So it, it, we experienced it once in August 12th, 83. They say that's when the Montauk project jumped off. August 12th, 2023, we can anticipate something else. And hopefully, hey, we, you know, if we know that there is a, magnetic cycle of the earth that really is tied in with humanity's timelines right yeah man we, we should be doing something we can tap to, into uh, it right? to to create the reality we want august 12 2023 you know so that's, my my uh, sense is that's when the party happens because the work is happening. <laughs> like, we should have a like we it's should like, have an alt media we, united we, party. Say that again. We should have an alt media united party. I mean, it's w without a doubt. But that like may, what you were, well, Ross, may. you were you were saying about like uh, the the Jupiter Neptune um conjunction which which happened it's like it's not so much like oh we missed the the window it's like no we went through the window and we did that we like yes yeah, so the, the, the retrograde yeah. and it's like uh, i like to think about the this analogy all the time it's like when you're a teenager and you're going through the greatest physical growth spurt in your in your life like you don't feel it you only know it because you measure like the back of your head on the side of a door and you check like a couple <laughs> months months later and you're an inch yep. taller and so like we collectively are changing like i don't think we can look around and not think this is happening um i don't think it's as evident with that like there are certain people who have shut down maybe even disappeared i don't know but they're the the majority of people who i interact on a regular are like their lives and their the the way they are moving and living has changed drastically and then within that there are certain like trailblazers and i would suggest that anyone who's kind of like doing this sort of stuff or listening to this stuff would probably uh, in my definition, constitute as trailblazers are literally like forming the 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 new paths on what this new what it's what it's going to look like. 
And this is yeah. the growth. Like, yeah, I'm not thinking like that. a year from now that stuff's happening. I'm like, <laughs> a year from now we're going to recognize what we've done in the same way when we talked about the, the free your mind, the free your mind conferences. If you could go back to like who you were nine years ago and you'll be like, listen, like this is what's going to happen. Like you wouldn't realize that that's what you kicked off then, but that's what, that's really what happened. And, and I think we're in the, the midst of it right now. I would affirm that because uh, where Mike and I synchromistically ended up during that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pittsburgh, on mounds, like doing mm. just that free in our mind <laughs> on the mounds, you know, like, and, and the immediate feedback we were getting from nature and just creation, it was like just a reaffirmation that, yeah, man, we opening and going through the portals with the full participation of the earth yeah. in that Jupiter Neptune cycle. So, and that is part of the science with, with the mounds. The whole idea is mounds are at geomantically sensitive points on the earth. So if you, whatever mm -hmm. you're thinking, whatever you're intending, your, your prayers, all those things are going to be amplified, magnified, and they're going to impact more people, you know? So, uh, yeah, I'm just affirming what, yeah, man. what, what you're saying, Mike. Can, can I piggyback on that for a second? Please. Please. All right. So, so uh, as Ross indicated, like we found ourselves, like it wasn't, it wasn't like the plan. It was like, oh, you know, this is when the big conjunction is happening. Let's go to Pittsburgh. Like that, that wasn't the plan. Like, like Pittsburgh contacted us. It came together. The weekend that it happened to be was like right in that window. And the story unfolded, which really linked together. Uh, within Pennsylvania, and I realize like Pennsylvania is just like a, like a section of land which, with these artificial borders, but nonetheless, in this Pennsylvania area, the specific area of North America, which ge geologically or minerally speaking is one of the most unique places in all hmm. of North America, like, and the, and the, and the, the, the rivers there, um, all three of them came together. We had, we had Philadelphia represented obviously by Ross, uh, the Susquehanna, which is in the middle, but closer to, 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 to Philadelphia, which was me. And then we came to the, what, what is really the beginning of the Mississippi river, uh, in Pittsburgh and completely like Ross and I didn't have anything to do with the planning or like the big picture of Pittsburgh, but we added our, our unique flavor of, of research and perspective to, to the overall presentation. Um, like the, something, something is happening like physically there. And then while we were there, there was, um, we, we still aren't like telling all the details because we're asked not to expose, like tell the, the, the details ourselves, mm -hmm. but the most ridiculous confirmation of like we're really tapping into something by recognizing uh and talking about mounds and what they are and 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 those who came before us like there, there there's a living breathing feedback loop which is all which is confirming like this 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 experience uh -huh. this work which we're doing Wow. Uh, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. I was listening. I was listening to your guys' show about that. And uh, one of the interesting things that I was thinking of is uh, Pa, PA, Pennsylvania being Pa or like Papa or mm. Daddy. And uh, Ma being Massachusetts, Maryland. MA, right, oh. right next to it. And it's, uh, it's Pa and Ma. And so uh, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, free your Pa and your mass will follow. <laughs> that is fucking hilarious because <laughs> nice. I, I was gonna go i had in my notes uh i had in my notes maryland which is land of mary and you know like or land of maya uh -huh. mary and motherland so that's that's interesting though because pa and ma th so the, the pittsburgh thing is fascinating and, and i know you guys can't talk too much about it because i think well, the boys brother khufu and john want to kind of like keep it into their you know they, they want to like make make a thing out of it and make it be special and have people come and experience that i mean well, it's not so much them but uh it's actually the seneca nation oh wow because it was uh 
we were at a mound where, you know, the Seneca, this is like their mound, you know? And there's some uh, important events that have occurred there recently that uh, they're going to make public. That uh, that's what it is we really can't speak on. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's absolutely fine. And I'm glad they're going to come public with something. That means that there's something in the works uh the mounds, timing the mounds are getting awakened wow. you know wow. the, uh the mounds are getting freed and it, it's almost like a uh example of it you know it's, it is it i'll be thankful when we can talk about it yeah yeah i will yeah. be too yeah no, I, I i i did that whole setup and i forgot to say like the whole point of it so <laughs> pittsburgh so pittsburgh so here i am in gnome countryside the on this property so that you got like the no man he's like 80 years old he's the guy who's really behind it and then there are two other and uh, he lives in a house and i'm stay i'm staying in the same house he lives in and then there are two other houses on the property and um two of his children and their families live on it as well so when i arrived here three weeks ago uh one of his sons uh was in pittsburgh so I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny because, you know, you mm. know, I was just in Pittsburgh, you know, I was just, you know, mm -hmm. making conversation. And, and I've, I've known this family for, for a very long time. And so uh, the no man leaves tomorrow to go to Pittsburgh. What? And so there's this this other sort of like connection to like uh, Pittsburgh keeps showing up in all of these different places. And so so there is definitely a magnetizing of 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 that area, at least within my immediate circle, uh, which is continuing, continuing to ha to happen. And and uh, for me, like the Pittsburgh experience, it answered a big question, well, gave more clarity to a big question I had, which is uh, why is Pennsylvania the Keystone State, you know? But because Pittsburgh is the portal, and when you study a Keystone and masonry, and I don't mean uh, speculative masonry, but like actual stone cutting, it's the keystone, that odd shaped stone mm -hmm. that keeps the arch open, you know? So it keeps the portal open. And I, I had no idea Pittsburgh was such a portal city in terms of the art and the architecture, art type symbols. You find portals, arches, bridges, tunnels. It's like the idea of a portal is like a part of the fabric of the city, you know? I even mm -hmm. saw one of the comments, they said the their public trans, transportation system out there is called the Port Authority, you know? <laughs> but uh, it, like the mystery of the Keystone has been kept unfolding for me. Wow. And as it relates to just Pennsylvania in general and the geomancy of the mm -hmm. uh, of the state, you know, and this is kind of tying into a opportunity that popped up from the Pittsburgh experience that we're preparing for in August, uh, being invited by William Padilla Brown to speak at a at the Michael Fest 2022, which is going to be where. Uh, Stonehenge Gardens. Oh, ma. Okay. And so the whole, a, 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 another whole dimension to this keystone. And, and I really will just pose it as a question. But is the keystone is what is needed to open up the Stonehenge? Ooh. that's a that is next level and can it, i, I want to maybe because yeah. i i had some i've done some uh, stonehenge at what state pennsylvania that? pennsylvania oh. stonehenge gardens it's uh okay. there's this whole stone well i i will mention 
you know, the major ley line that runs the Northeast, you know, like Boston, New York, Philly, DC, Baltimore, you, I, one name that's apt, that's appropriate for that ley line is the Stonehenge Tia Hawakin ley line. Oh, wow. Because basically that's, you know, if you draw, if you make the globe and I, I, I know I'm starting something with some <laughs> folk, right? Oh, you Whatever. Good. <laughs> you good. <laughs> if you make the globe 2D and then draw a line from Stonehenge to Tia to Walking down in uh, Mexico, uh, you'll hit all those cities, you know? So mm. Philly is on a Stonehenge ley line. Wow. Know? And so that was one of the angles I was looking at this keystone mystery from uh, is the keystone. Is there something about Philly? Is there something about Pennsylvania that is a keystone that can open up that stone hinge portal? You know, another uh, event that I heard about that kind of reaffirmed like hmm, there's some link we got to follow up is that tying back to the Philadelphia experiment August 12 43 yeah it is like legend or lore that uh Aleister Crowley at the time they were doing like you know firing up the generators on the Eldridge here in Philadelphia Aleister Crowley was at Stonehenge in England conducting his uh one of his deepest sex magic rites, you know. Wow. So uh having just playing around with all that, it had me thinking, like, man, is there something about is this why Pennsylvania is the Keystone State? This is before I went to Pittsburgh, you know. <laughs> is, is is PA the Keystone? that can unlock the stone hinge, you know? Cause uh, right, stone hinge are those megalithic structures, but also just a hinge, just like a key is a part of, a you know, getting into a door. Wow. A hinge is what connects the door to the, the doorway, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> Here we are going to end up in doing a presentation in August in Stonehenge Gardens, which is not far. It's in the same general area of a park that's called uh, the PA Stonehenge because they have built this megalithic park here in Philadelphia, uh, excuse me, in Pennsylvania. It's called PA Stonehenge. I can't recall the Kumasil, uh, the, the name of the actual park. Because it has uh, PA Stonehenge just kind of like this nickname. Mm -hmm. Because it has these uh, megalithic stone structures like Stonehenge, you know. But when you study PA Stonehenge with the Stonehenge Gardens. Key points on the Susquehanna in relationship to Philly is utter bananas, man, the geomancy, you know? It's, yeah. And uh, this is what, all of this has unfolded for me since Pittsburgh, you know? This is like what's, that Pittsburgh portal has opened up for myself and just in terms of the research of this state you know can i touch on two things there because that okay first of all that's gonna blow a lot of people's fucking minds because there's so many things questions about you know the the the, the stone monoliths megaliths you know and what have you um and somebody one of our amazing uh, members of our telegram group just posted this video of a stonehenge in texas just mm. this morning too mm. and uh you know, when I don't know, I think if Mark sent you the Rick Osman episode, 
um, one of our episodes. Is that one of the ones you listen to, Rick Osman? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, so mm-hmm. he he does he 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 wrote this book called Graves of the Golden Bear, and it's basically like uh, mysteries of the Ohio River Valley, and that there was ancient uh, Roman coins found there and that he has these connections of like these the the roman empire that was here way before that was ever supposed to be right and he told this story of this south american uh uh, um uh, traveling uh these members of a traveling crew that were delivering things to northern american tribes or crews what have you and he's like the things that they were carrying were perishable and it's so many miles away that it's like how were they getting there you Mm, know and so that yes so it's like that episode I'm, i'm wondering were they they these heightened conscious individuals these indigenous individuals that have very much connection to the stones and to the inner workings maybe these underground tunnels these are portals maybe not so much necessarily like dematerializing yourself and transporting somewhere else or maybe you can at certain times like you're talking about with the philadelphia experiment okay that whole rabbit hole blew my mind i love that philadelphia experiment it's crazy to think about you know and and it's a conspiracy because who's going to, you know, in the, in the modern sense, you know, of society, people aren't going to believe that a ship transported not only time, but also space, right. you know? And so, but, but the more we look at it in these types of research that we do this esoteric research, we can get down with that. And when you look at cosmological uh, timing, like this 40 year cycle, you know, maybe there's smaller cycles in between that, that our ancestors actually knew about and were tapped into. Okay, there's that thing. The other thing that I had in my notes, and I'm glad that we, we brought this up because I was, you know, curious about this keystone. And I recently went to Florida and I was looking into the uh, the foundation, uh, the esoteric foundation of Florida itself. And it was built by this man named Henry Flagler, who is John D. Rockefeller's mentor and business partner in Standard Oil Company. He founded all of Florida and he built this railway that went all the way from New York, all the way down, basically constructing the Panama Canal and to the Keys and to the Keys, Florida Keys, the Florida Keys. Right. And so I'm like Florida, wondering, Florida is a phallic shape, too. It is. And but it's also very matriarchally uh, dominated, right? Like Miami, Miami is like the land of Maya also, which I think was just like interesting with that connection of Maryland, you know, Mary and Maya, you know, birthing Hermes and Jesus, they're kind of like the same, uh, the same archetypal character. But I'm wondering, because I looked at, you know, kind of what you guys do with the 40th, I, I try to do that same thing. But in Florida, and looking at the esoteric structure and foundation of Florida, and I found that there is like a huge occult ritual there that has to do with mirrors and i was like what is up with this mirrors mirrors Mirrors. okay and so in the right in the age of spiritualism and the the rise of spiritualism in the late 1800s um you know you have psychomantiums you have spirits traveling through mirrors and this huge magical traditions that are popping up right and so that is when henry flagler started establishing um all these huge hotels luxury hotels down in florida and these are the first buildings in america to have electricity in every room thomas edison himself came and put light bulbs into these hotels henry flagler being john d rockefeller's business partner and starting standard oil company was one of the richest men in the entire world and so he built this railway to go down to this like they basically were calling it the new frontier right florida was completely like he built Orlando, he built Miami, he built Palm Springs, he built Florida. And I say mirrors because it's a land of water. Mirrors are used in occult magic and, and traditions. What are right? mirrors? I'm not familiar with that. Mirrors, like an actual mirror. Like mm-hmm. a legitimate mirror like that you look M-I-R-R-O-R. into. M-I-R-R-O-R? Yes. Yeah, okay. like a mirror. Like a land of mirrors because it's a land what of lakes. What we say on the East Coast, we say mirror. Oh, sorry. Oh, mirror. Right, right, right. I got you. <laughs> 
<laughs> my bad uh but yet so you know uh, I thought it was like some water entity like, I, I, I'm, I'm watching this whole thing and, and i can see in ross's eyes he's like he, he's thinking you're saying something he's like i don't know what you're talking about you're like it's mirror dude it just you know the thing you look at is refer and just that was funny What's the name of this guy again? I want to go check him as you're talking check about. Check him out, please. Because What's it needs his name again? Henry Flagler. Uh, and and that's so interesting because you know Miami is the magic city. I'm telling yeah. you, fucking guys, I, I opened a fucking wormhole with this. And so that's why we're <laughs> looking into this esoteric America and the syncretism, the stacking of cultures, because it's it's everywhere everywhere is very important and very specifically syncretic to the building of it and so yeah. florida blew my mind and so they they came from where where did where did standard oil company get created by john d rockefeller john d rockefeller right mm. not to be mistaken with john, john d. d the mystic of you know of ancient right. europe right francis bacon all that shit queen elizabeth blah blah, blah. um columbus ohio right Ohio. They were fucking in Ohio, and right. then they go down to Florida, the, and and it's you know heavily occultic, and it's like there's so this the weird... Miami mm -hmm. are indigenous to Ohio. They're not even mm -hmm. oh, they're not even <laughs> in Miami in Florida. Uh, that's nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. And so Henry B. Plant and Henry Flagler are the two men who created railways. Henry Flagler created the West Coast of Florida. Henry B. Plant created the East Coast. That's a mirror. That's a fucking mirror. They're both Henrys. Who would have planted why? a flag? And have planted the flag exactly. And so we, <laughs> I'll send you guys this episode. We did it with uh, Juan Thomas, paranoid American, and our friend Gabe, slick dissident, and we did a huge Florida breakdown. And it's just nuts because you look at these so like in occultic. Uh, Symbolism, you have pillars, right? Joachim and Boaz, these two pillars. And in the tarot cards, you have pillar symbolism everywhere. What's California? What's Florida? They're the pillars of this fucking country. They're the two long states that hold up the pillar of this whole occultic ritualistic spell that is is America. Let me and let me add this in, which goes right to it. I've always loved, like, I. you gave me a new context for something I've always been holding in my mind, and it's the fact, like, Orange County, Orange County, Disneyland, Disney World. Yes. Yep. Cheep, exactly. Yep. Yeah. It's, I, and, and it's, it's such a big one that, like, I'm only, like... Hollywood. You can't, exactly. Hollywood. You're it's absolutely Hollywood, right. Florida, for sure. It's it's nuts, and they're mirroring each other. It's a fucking mirror. And so what happened, you fold it up, Right. I don't even know. It's nuts. But I, OK, so we're coming on this three hour mark <laughs> and we're, we're going to wrap it up here. But let's wrap it up with maybe Dan asked question. I asked question to both you guys, both answer something like that. Let's mirror make it happen. All right. I like that. Uh, Dan, you want to you want to <laughs> do him on the spot? Let's, yeah, let's, just... let's, let's come up with questions, Dan. <laughs> Man, well, you know what? Uh... It could be an easy question. It could have absolutely nothing to do with anything. It could be mm -hmm. like, you know, like, like it could, it could be anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, shit, man. I, I was getting really into all that Florida stuff. And now you just like killed my brain and sent me on a different path. It's just too and long. We'd get too way too deep into it. Man. I know. Any Sorry. question that I would have right now would be way too long for a wrap up because what I really wanted uh, would my set of questions were kind of wrapped into the Susquehanna river and, and to uh, the great mystery of Philadelphia and, and these two locations and how they pair um, and the connections that they have with each other based on this uh, 40th parallel stuff that they've been working on and how they're connected and, and how almost these places have a creation aspect to them because um through these different events, they have created a reality that exists in our uh, realm of reality. And so that's kind of what I was going to get into. So I would love, I would just, I'm just going to wrap it up with saying, I would, I, I would love to talk to you guys individually together with 40 other people. It doesn't matter, but I would really like to get into um, 
the great mystery of Philadelphia and the Susquehanna River in greater, deeper detail. And then maybe have you guys on again and talk about the 40th parallel together and how that encapsulates those two areas. Mm -hmm. And then we can maybe get into some all kinds of great stuff from there. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I can just respond find... to that question in a minute. Like I got, so I got okay. something good for you. So, right. um, so it wasn't uh, really a question, but I feel you, but, but, but this, you're asking how do they connect or, or like, or yeah. something along those lines. So when Lancaster as a city was established, like sometime after Philadelphia, this is like in the 1730s, um, the very first road that connected the two and Lancaster was the largest, uh, the largest city in the colonies at that time, which was not on the Atlantic Ocean or on a major waterway, the largest inland city. Um, it was connected by a road. And this road was the very first turnpike, meaning you had to pay for it uh, to go uh, to use it. And it went from Freemasonic Lodge to Freemasonic Lodge, and they're both right on the 40th parallel. So that is, you know, just to begin the, the, the question, like I'd be happy to have this, the conversation or a show dedicated to just this topic in the future, but we can go and see that the infrastructure on the level of culture was established with both private ownership, payment, and the road was called King Street is what they called it. The King's, mm, High, it was King's, King's Highway. Highway. And 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 Masonic Lodge, the Masonic Lodge, right. And the uh, the beginning point of it in Philadelphia is U Penn, and and it's like Lancaster Avenue in the city today. <laughs> you know, it's called Lancaster Avenue, Route Thirty. It, you know, the the yeah. avenue to Lancaster, but the actual beginning of it is like a. Uh, uh, field at UPenn and then the road starts, you know? Does Philadelphia have any uh, deeper meaning if you break down the word? Does it, is there a certain esoteric meaning behind that? Because well, I, I see Delphi in it and, that, right. and that's kind of like the oracle, right? Yeah, so most people say, oh, Philly, city of brotherly love. You know, like that's what they take it as and on one level it does mean that but i think philadelphia is named what it is for two reasons one is to manipulate the prophecy of the church of philadelphia oh which is revelations chapter three and just real quick out of the seven churches of revelations there's only one church that received a benevolent prophecy, and that was the Church of Philadelphia. So uh, one way to manipulate a historical or prophetic timeline is to enact a historical event that mimics- Or mirrors. Or mirrors. Or me fulfillment mirrors. Fulfillment of prophecy, but has a nefarious intention embedded in it, you know? So yeah. that's one reason Philadelphia has that name. The other goes back to the uh, Greek Pharaoh, Ptolemy Philadelphus, mm. who is like, who Ben Franklin, Ptolemy Philadelphus increased his empire through establishing colleges and universities, specifically Alexandria. So Ben Franklin comes in the image of Tottenham in Philadelphia, you know, establishing New Penn, establishing the Free Library. He is like the Heraclean god of this city. And his archetype model of a Herculean king would be top of me Philadelphus, you know? Mm. And then the pen, the pen is what the scribe holds uh, that goes back to uh, Toth too. And when you chase, um, this is another deep thing real quick. Uh, <clears throat> when you chase the etymon etym 
etymology of pen. It means yeah. those who reside on the mound. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, Check like it out. Oh. Look almost, at like the, the uh... etymological roots of pen, like uh, William Penn and Mike Pence. They are all Pence and Penn is the same family root. Pinnacle. Pinnacle, yes. Yeah, wow. there you go. Those who live the on top. top of the mound. Nice. Oh, shit. That is what Penn, the family name Penn means. Wow. Pentagram. That kind of pen Pentacle. Oh. oh, yeah. Wow. I'm going to have to. That's That opens up a whole rabbit hole of shit. Mo Moses, Moses goes to the pentacle of the mountain mm -hmm. to, to receive the... Uh, receive the knowledge from the pen and he writes uh also you you we brought up sevens a lot in here and g the letter g is seven so g gnome the gnome the seven the seven hells the seven heavens the gnomes <laughs> there's a big deeper connection there guys i'm just saying Stop and then, uh, uh, roman what you got um i was going to uh to ask some college questions with like uh with the uh through you guys's research you found this connection with universities inevitably right um these building of these these universities on the 40th parallel and what's some sort of like cool mysterious uh findings that you've uh that you've had um connecting these universities together and uh and you know i think i think we're gonna maybe uncover some something with the mound where they where mounds were moved to put universities on and uh yeah just just mysterious university stuff because the colleges are really interesting uh you i'll go first um uh so I mentioned a little bit earlier in our sh our conversation about the John Smith map of Virginia. Um, and I indicated that there was like a, um, there was a, a hidden code written in it. And in that code, it's it's uh, um, the long and the short of it is the 40th parallel at the Susquehanna River. And if you go and you look at that in in material reality is and take that as literally as you can take it, like 40.00 degrees um, at the river. And I indicated that I was in a town right by there on the other side of the river, which still would be uh, would meet that that qualification is. Um, a park which was founded in 2007. So keep in mind that park was founded in 2007, actually on the 400th anniversary of the establishment of Jamestown, which is where the map originates. But the point to answer your question about the colleges, um, that point is the epicenter of an absolutely perfect cross. Like if you were to go and map it out or like put the like pins on a map, a perfect cross um, of four colleges and three of them are uh, exactly um, the same distance from this epicenter of this park, which was not established, which was established hundreds of years after the colleges. And so the, the three colleges um, that are on the, the, the short part of the, of the, of the cross are Franklin and Marshall College, which was founded in 1787, and it's named for Ben Franklin because Ben Franklin was the person who put the money up to establish it. That's kind of like the, the story, like Ben Franklin. They named it after him because he was the financial backer. Uh, and the other college, which we know are this more of a university, which is associated with Ben Franklin is University of, Pe of Pennsylvania, but that doesn't hold his name. So there's, there's something of significance also with the name, uh, to have a name tied to a college or university or a bridge. Bridges are really big deals also in terms of the, the Masonic naming. But the other colleges are York College, which was founded um, same year, 1787, by a guy who was also um, a, uh, who went on to become the provost at 
uh, Ben Franklin's University of, of Pennsylvania. And then the third one, which is at the top of the cross, is Elizabethtown College. But less than a mile away from there is the Masonic Homes, the official uh, retirement community of um, of you know, for Freemasons in, in Pennsylvania, associated with the, the Grand Lodge of, of Pennsylvania. So you've got those three colleges right there, which are, if you put a, a compass point in the middle or, or a compass point on that park that's, that, at, that's located at the 40th parallel on the Susquehanna River, you would see each one of those colleges not only is on the circumference of that circle drawn, but they make a perfect T-square. And if you were to extend that T-square down 70 miles, it goes into Maryland and it lines up with Washington College, a college which was founded in, I want to say like uh, in the 1760s. It predates all the other colleges and that is named Washington College because George Washington is the uh, was the financial backer behind it. So that is to me uh, and your college in Lancaster, uh, the city of York and the city of Lancaster in Pennsylvania, which are on the east and west sides of the Susquehanna River, they are known quite literally like their 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 official nicknames are the Red Rose and the White Rose City. Like this is like the total Rose Cross. Mm -hmm. And this is a Rose Cross <laughs> made of four colleges tied to some of the biggest names in our history. And it is completely centered right on the 40th parallel in the Susquehanna River. Like I, th I always think that's kind of an interesting thing, uh, especially Just going with, with Francis Bacon being literally the creator of the Rosie Cross. Like that's and and also the English modern English language as well. Like that's yeah, yeah very it's, significant. It's, and his supposed shit. mother was Elizabeth, so Elizabethtown College. And Francis Bank Bacon lived in York House, and it was York College. And the, and then Ben Franklin is BF and FB, and they're both like accredited with all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's they're it's, fucking mirrors. Mirrors. They're mirrors. And that ties <laughs> into what I was saying too with Ben Franklin, his uh, Herculean hero model. Right, Tommy Philadelphus, who ex established an empire through building colleges and live universities and libraries. That, exactly, oh that does tie in. Jesus, it ties in. You know, that's that's a classic example of it. You know, right there. Uh, <sighs> one thing I would mention. The synchro. One other thing I would mention, just this kind of mind. To me, one of the most mind blowing things, it is directly related to U Penn. And it seems like the when you when you look at U Penn's museum and the uh, archaeological finds that they collected from around the world, they were doing time lensing experiments before the Philadelphia experiment. And they had uh, specifically uh, like sarcophaguses and uh, monuments from Egypt that would tie them into who was like the Egyptian Prometheus, Ramesses II, you know? And they also had this huge, crystal ball like one of the largest crystal handcrafted crystal balls ever made i think it was from china wow and uh just some other stuff that they had when you add it all up like at, at face value it seems like a random collection oh because the other thing too was uh, a a sarcophagus related to patah seker who was like the like uh, in the Titanokami or like in Greek traditions, there's two Prometheuses. There's the ancient, ancient Prometheus who 17,000 years ago ended the golden age, right? But then during uh, dynastic Egypt in the 19th dynasty, there was the uh, Pharaoh Ramesses II his time lensing, time manipulation uh, efforts at Abydos Temple uh, 
definitely worth studying and researching, but he's like the second Prometheus. And U Penn had like their Egyptian expedition. Those are the pharaohs, out of all the pharaohs and all the dynasties, these were the pharaohs who uh, the Egyptian exhibit at U Penn is founded on, you know? Ptah Seker and <laughs> massively a cult. Seker, who is like I, uh, you know, the modern Prometheus. I, I don't want to get too uh, overly descriptive, but uh, U Penn, uh, Penn being short for penis also, and uh, Ptah Sucker is Peter Sucker. <laughs> and Pindar. <laughs> Penis oh. to the circle. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, it's like the um so we've been getting into this uh this me and this this person on on Telegram who's awesome. She looks into like all the the royal stuff and like the draconian like lizard reptilian shit of the royals and I've been looking into this thing I call antiquated transhumanism where it's like taking this three major pieces of antique technology the crown the scepter and the Gro globus cruciger and how they were used as a holy trinity of technology technological pieces to expand the consciousness tap into the other realm to heighten the vibratory frequency so they can go into the other realm and a, and a, and a connection i made today and looking into that that manly p hall transcript specter is another name for a ghost. So the scepter is the wand that they hold. That is an alchemical creation of conductive materials. The Globus Cruciger is this ball. Okay, so you reminded me of it when you said pen. So standing on top of the hill, on top of the mound, is the pen, right? Or the penis protruding from the ball, which is the Globus Cruciger, this thing sticking up and you look at it i have i have hundreds of pictures depicted with the globus cruciger and it's a ball what is inside the globus cruciger what is inside i think it's ambrosia i think it's placenta we think it might be castrated bits and so we're talking about this you know th ambrosia this ambrosia would be sperm exact well exactly right exactly i think it's i think it's a mixture it's now chemical mixture of something to um to kind of like tap in to get the the like the vibes going because these why would royals hold these holy trinity of technology only to tap into the god state and to this heightened vibratory state so they could tap in to what it is to be a god to vibe so hard in their opinion right like obviously we have a different opinion what it is to be godlike but this is heavy occult heavy heavy occult heavy esoteric so it's on a different level than, than we're able to understand and now it's so suppressed and underground right but but back in these days you know it's just so crazy and so that's what i was kind of thinking was like you kind of brought up this you know this penis. the penis and it just reminds me because it <laughs> looks like a straw on a cup you know do you guys know what i'm talking about the globus cruciger yeah you guys know what i'm talking about it looks like a fucking cup like what is inside of it like mm. what is it oh, i need to know baby and so uh we'll figure it out someday you know <laughs> but the royals are still using it they like the royal and everything they still do it and they hold these traditions tight um it's mm. nuts i didn't mean to side tangent too much there and jump out of my chair like a cartoon character um uh, but i wanted to give you guys a little theatrics you know it's it's getting late so i wanted to keep it keep it going you guys are amazing thank you so much thank you so much you guys tied a lot of of knots together for us and i i mean <laughs> i'm just i'm blown away by this and ross you came in here you know, like after Mike and I were, or Mike and us, sorry, uh, Mike and Dan and yeah. I were, were chatting. All about me, huh? Never forget about you, baby. <laughs> you are my, you this are my guy, soulmate for e eternity. Uh, and then we just kept me, on man. swinging, and then it just, it just, it was amazing. I mean, this couldn't have gone any better. So I, I'm grateful for you guys. I'm so grateful for your work. Thank you guys so much. Seriously.
blessings. Give thanks, you know. It's good to uh, get the affirmation and the feedback, you know, that uh, this 40th parallel work is resonating with people. Because like I told you, man, primarily what's my motivation? I, I, I enjoy it. It's fun. This research excites me for whatever reason. I don't know, <laughs> you know? And so to hear that it's inspiring others and, and, and it's being well received, I give thanks, you know? Yes, Thank brother. You. I give thanks to you. Yes. Do you guys have any uh, final closing out uh, thoughts or statements? Anything you guys want to say to the Fire Tribe um, as before we sign out here? Raz? Uh, I am going to, uh, we do have the schedule for the Wissahickon tours, the Wissahickon yeah. walks for this summer. It's going to be four walks. Uh, I don't have the dates right in front of me, but there will be a promotional video. Nice. This week that you could look for. And uh, yeah, we got the Michael Fest 2022 coming up at Stonehenge Gardens, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure. Tam Tamaqua, is that how you pronounce the city, Mike? Possibly. <laughs> yeah, so I'm interested in exploring that region uh, of the state. And that's what, August 5th through 7th. That's August 5th through 7th. So yeah, like, so Michael Fest has in like uh, mushrooms, M-Y-C-O. Oh, M-Y-C-O, nice, nice. And so it's a, it's a, it's a good blending of, of ideas and people coming together. So I'm really excited about that, about that. But so that did go down. Mm -hmm. I heard you talking with Mark. You were like, I don't know if it's going to happen or if it's going to turn into fruition, but, uh, That's, you know, yeah. and it did, it's, dude, that's fucking it's moving, awesome. It's moving forward. I think it's going to be something really good. Like, I mean, this is, uh, and, and the, the guy who's putting this together is, is within that realm uh, he's a foremost expert. Like, you know, this is, this is definitely, uh, um, this is a top quality event and there's limited number of tickets too. Right? Nice. To be honest, I think it's sold out. When yeah, I, I think it's already sold out too. When I looked on it, it just sold out. But, uh, people can also go check out your website, rossbin.com. Yeah, rossbin.com. A book. Yeah. My latest book, Knowledge of the no the Nomo. Right, <laughs> no gun science. Yeah, uh, I haven't even really had the opportunity to promote it like I envisioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe this later in this summer season or autumn season, I will have some uh, uh, like YouTube events around it, so I people cool. can know what this thing is they need to get up on it knowledge of no mo you know i know mo <laughs> you gotta know more about the gnomes baby that's right excellent mike one uh yeah like uh you could always go to my website susquehannaalchemy.com and see the sort of stuff which i have there as services and so forth uh, i also do tours uh in the area i've been to ross's tours I, if i definitely recommend those these are a lot of fun i think the tours are some of the most fun things because mm -hmm. you get to go and you have like feet on the ground and you have real conversations with people and you're around like-minded folks like the the those are those are the best and they're the most affordable things too it's like you know they're immensely intimate and they're immensely like affordable and 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 they're very memorable uh and then also um i, I have a subscribe star account susquehanna alchemy as well and that's where i put out like a little bit more personal stuff and i tie in more of of my story and then also well you would know on alt media united i have uh, the podcast with mark mm -hmm. which we put out every week so um your got your handbook to the apocalypse so uh any of mm -hmm. those are, are are good ways to 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 support or follow along nice oh and i'm also like that's if you're nice. in the area like gnome countryside you want to come like, I mean, there's the, I mean, 
uh, if I'm here, I could meet with people individual, or like specifically if they're going to come here, but you still want to come down here. There's an Airbnb mm -hmm. here. This place is spectacular. So that's like, you know, outside of Philly and, and Baltimore, check that out. That's definitely a, a cool thing. And I'm excited. Um, Let's go, Roman. I always like to see yeah, people I think, face to face. I think the next episode from the 40th is going to be. Yeah, we're going to film yeah. it here. Yeah. We're going to film so, it dude. where where the orbs were. Dude. Yeah. Oh, that. Nice. Yeah, and if anyone's listening, we're looking for a cameraman. So, like, you might be able to get an inside an inside Ooh. shot of that conversation if you can handle the AV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Excellent. tremendous, boys. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us. We appreciate your time and going extra time with us, too. It's been fabulous. Uh, we've enjoyed the conversation. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, Fire Tribe, for listening. And if you're not down with that, Wake, wake up. up.